I give her the respect she deserves. I pop my head up and I keep walking straight because I don't want to feel creepy and I don't want her to feel creepy. It's natural. I mean, that's what a titty is for, to be sucked. <coughs> I mean, it's, it's really there for, you know, the baby. So I don't see why people complain about you breastfeeding. I see it all the time now, if, that people get pissed off. But Now, if I see a grown man sucking a titty in public, I kind of got a problem with that. But on the other hand, there's a lot of motherfuckers. Unless, unless, he, unless he got an issue where he can't eat whole food, then I'm okay with Can him. You imagine? That's the next thing, like service dogs. <laughs> That's the next thing, service dog. You know how people have service dogs? Uh-huh. One day somebody's going to say, you know what, because my mom fed me and I depend on her. <laughs> I need to suck titties and shit. In Two titties a day to survive. <laughs> well, there's people who do like a baby thing. Have you seen that? Like there's people who like pretending they're babies. I saw this video of a girl who's like 20s in a diaper. She has a big crib in her room. Her boyfriend pretends he like changes her diaper. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's, that's sickening. Crazy. I've seen I've seen kids like that's too old to be sucking titties. Like you ever seen a video with a little boy about seven years old sucking a mama <laughs> titty with the little brother? I sucked a pacifier till I was six. I was on my way to being a little dick sucker, <laughs> but my mother stopped that. You understand me? When you suck a pacifier at six, your future is bleak. You follow what I'm saying to you? This show, The Church of What's Happening Now, is brought to you by Lending Tree. Are you looking to buy a house? You know what I'm saying? You put your little application in, the bank, they work you over. Did you know that depending on where you get your mortgage, you can save $20,000 or more? But 80% of people only get one mortgage offer. And if you just go to your bank, chances are you'll get ripped off, screwed. Lending Tree doesn't want that to happen. Are you sure you want the best deal? Find out what you can save today at LendingTree.com slash church. Again, that's LendingTree.com slash church. Number one, Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Uh, cooking together builds strong family bonds. Research shows that Blue Apron's families cook nearly three times more often together. Let me tell you about the upcoming meals. You got yourself a little basil pesto chicken, <laughs> sauteed shrimp with green beans, whole grain pasta, and it goes on and onward. What I'm going to do for you is this. Check out this week's menu and get your three first meals for free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash Joey. Again, that's blueapron.com slash Joey. I'm going to give you three meals with shipping sent to your house. Recipe card, you're going to have a party with mama. All right. Again. Go to blueapron.com slash Joey. Kick that motherfucking mule leaf. Kick it, Lee. <laughs> it's a church of what's happening now. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. We're going to take Mrs. Pat back to the old school when she was walking and shit with hot pants on. Saying, <laughs> What? What year is this, Lee? 82, my girl. Oh, yeah. I probably did have a uh, hot pad. Shit. A couple years other than that, I was somebody mama. Shit. <laughs> That's that disco music. Someone to hold you tight. Someone to treat you right. Oh, shit. A friend of mine. There we go. There we go. Anytime. Thanks to you. Call me. me. You need someone to talk to, baby. Call, Call me. There's a fashion guarantee. Call, Call me. Need someone to talk to me. Call, Call me. me. Call me. Oh, shit. Shake that ass, cocksuckers. <laughs> it's the church of what's happening now. Monday, August 7th. <laughs> or Wednesday, August 9th. The day the devil was buried at sea. <laughs> Hit it. Hit it. That's my birthday. Mule, kick it up. Kick it, Lee. <laughs> oh shit. Uh uh. Uh uh. A friend of mine. Anytime. I'll sound actually. <laughs>
That's a fucking jam, dog. <laughs> Churchill, what's happening now? Coming at you. It's a beautiful day to be alive. Miss Pat is in the house. What's up? The fucking flying Jew is in the house. Hello. Miss Pat's youngest, beautifulest daughter is in the house. Hi. She's the oldest. That's my Medicaid baby. Okay, she's beautiful. Yeah. What does that mean? She was born on Medicaid. Okay. <laughs> your taxes paid for her to get out of me. <laughs> Thanks to you paying your taxes, they was able to pull out with a nice fee. Uh, <laughs> now, when you had the baby, they put you in a nice hospital too. Uh, I, well, you go always go. Poor people always go to the poor people hospital, or the community hospital, or so. I Medicaid. Well, that's not like the baby's coming out of you, <laughs> and you walk into like Beverly Hills Hospital with a bunch of white people. They'll still deliver your baby. They can't uh, put back you in them that. days, they'd be like, oh, you belong down the street. It was 86. They probably would have. But, you know, I couldn't get to Beverly Hills. Actually, when I went in labor with her, you know, I had her at 14. And when they pulled up, when I when I called the ambulance, I lived in the hood in Vine City. And my sister went and called 911, and she lied and said the baby was coming out. But the ambulance was up the street picking up another dude who just got stabbed. So they ran down to my house with this nigga in the back of the car, and they come to get me, and the baby ain't coming out. So my mom was like, you're going to take her anyway. So I'm in the ambulance with another dude that been stabbed in the shoulder. Oh, my God, it's like an Uber pool. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible, and you're 14. <laughs> no, my, I was like, Mama, you going me? She said, you can handle that shit. I ain't got time for that. I come pick you up. So it was me. I'm pregnant with her and some random drunk dude in the back of the ambulance that who's been stabbed. Miss Pat, what are you, 40, 39? I'm 45. What and she's 31. What the fuck are you going to do when you hit 50? You're going to wake up that day and go, Jesus Christ. That's what I did. The day I woke up and I turned 50, I was like, Jesus Christ. I was in an ambulance you, I don't giving feel birth. Old. No, no, I don't feel old either. That's not the point. The oh, okay. point is at one at one time in your life, you know, I, I've I've done it. I've done it a thousand times. I've been in those situations. You know, you you started going to meetings, you sat across some pretty high, high powered people, in the middle of a motherfucking meeting, while you're telling your stories, you know, and they're offering you salsa water, or a bagel, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, say I don't eat that shit. And you're looking at them, thinking. These motherfuckers have no idea what I've really seen. Yeah. You ever get that feeling sometimes? You ever walk into a room and everybody's fucking really nice, and they, they all have watches on and purses and shit, <laughs> and you know, like 20 years ago, me and my dogs would have shot these motherfuckers and taken everything, <laughs> including that turkey on the table. <laughs> yeah, it's I do. fucking <laughs> crazy. turkey on the table. You know, I'm reading this book that Bob Lingus gave me, The Three Lives of Jimmy Page. And it's like I had three fucking lives, four lives. And so did you. Yeah, Rabbit. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Rabbit. And Patricia, then Miss Pat. Yeah, pretty much. You have a bunch of, we have, and then you look back, like one day you're doing something, and it makes you reflect, it makes you think of that life. And you have like an anxiety attack. Like, you know what really gets me when I look back sometimes, like to me, my kids, I have a 19 and a 17 year old at the house. And I just think they're so ungrateful, like how they waste shit and they waste the food and shit. And, you know, they, oh, mama, let me let me get your debit card. I could have never asked my mama for a fucking whole <laughs> book of food stamps. She would have stabbed my motherfucking ass. And, like, we grew up we grew up eating, like, the chicken back and chicken ass. I don't know if you ever ate chicken ass, but it's like it's like the poor nigga nugget, little ass to hang out the back of the chicken back. Is, and this little inch of it. Yeah, the little inch little of inch ass. Of, oh, I've eaten it by fat. mistake. But. <laughs> no, where I come from, that was, that was poor people chicken nuggets. <laughs> so we grew up eating chicken ass where my kids, is just they just so fucking wasteful. And that shit, it pisses me off. It pisses me off so bad because I was like, you motherfuckers are waste stuff. When I grew up eating, I grew up thinking the only part of the chicken was the chicken back and the chicken eggs. Because the wing and leg went to other people, grown people. We got the fucking back. You know ain't no fucking meat on the back. You suck them bones and by the time you eat that little meat hanging off that ass. And then when you grow up and realize you ate a lot of chicken ass, <laughs> you get pissed the fuck off. I was like, as many food stamps we got, why the fuck are we eating chicken ass? Chicken ass is good until you know it's chicken ass. Then you like, I ate chicken ass for years. That's the craziest. Like the the part for me that's hardest to under like comprehend when you say you had a kid at fourteen. Like like all right yeah. Like how do you think about providing any like food or anything for a kid when you're like like at fourteen? I was excited to be, be, be making a hundred bucks a week 
at like a grocery store or something like that's I think when you have a, I think as a, when you have a kid and you're in a situation like, well, with me, when I had that kid that young, my survival move just kicked in. You know, like, it's like if you. That's it. You just you adjust. Just, you, you, you have Lee, to you adjust. adjust. You have even, to adjust. Even like, even if you're you a young 14 year old boy who get kicked out on the street by your parents, you got, it's your survival skill kicked in. If you got, if you, if, if not, you're going to fucking die. So not only did I have me to feed, I had a fucking child to feed. Which was hard. I mean, a, a can of milk back in those days was $4. Fucking that shit is really high now. I couldn't even afford $4. So I would go to the local convenience store. I mean, the little store on the corner and steal fucking milk. Because I was, you know, I was too young to get a job. So they was like, you know, when I had my my second child at 15, they was like, well, where's your work permit? So I would take them on interviews. Here, motherfucker, meet Ashley and Nike. That's my fucking work permit. Give a nigga a job. But I wasn't old enough. So, you know, that's how the drug thing came along. But you, you did drugs for a while? Hell no. no. I sold drugs. No, sold I never drugs. did no, drugs. No. I never smoked, drank, or anything. But your survival mood kick in. So that's that's how I was able to, you know, to take care of the kids. Plus, I didn't want them to, I didn't want them to be fucked up like I was. I'm just thinking, like, at 14, I think, what, that's eighth grade, ninth grade? Eighth. Well, you know, back then, it was no middle school, so you went straight from elementary to high school. So I was in elementary school with a boyfriend with a car. And, you know, I'm not thinking, I'm naive. I'm thinking this is the coolest shit in the world. I'm like, y'all hoes playing with these boys on bikes. My boyfriend got a car. <laughs> My boyfriend got a car. <laughs> he ride by the playground. Hey, hey. hey. Yeah, I'm like, y'all some lame bitches. Your boyfriend got a Huffy. My boyfriend got a Chevy with no with no uh, flow board in the motherfucker and a boom box on the back seat. <laughs> you know, I thought that was the life. Well, we got because that back then black people had just calmed down from towing the boombox, so they was no longer towing them. They was putting them on the back seat of their car so can, they can have. If you couldn't afford the boom, you put the fucking <laughs> the, uh, the boombox on your back seat. So my boyfriend had a car. Y'all boyfriend had a fucking huffy. I thought it was cool. When I was in the eighth or seventh grade, there was a kid in my class that knocked up a chick. He was gonna fucking live with it in the seventh grade. Juan Soto was his name. He was thirteen, going on thirty-five. Did she keep it? You know what? He never came back to school. Well, which, he couldn't. He probably had to go fucking. Yeah, he had to go get a job. No, he went yeah. and got a job. I never, oh ever, ever heard from him or saw him again. But I always thought about him. Like what? He was in love with this girl. They were like childhood, and they would walk home together. I think she, she he was. In, he was in the seventh grade. She was in the eighth grade. But he was like thirteen. He had gotten left back because it was English when he came from Cuba. So, but to fucking uh, commit to a home at thirteen, like that's it. Like, it's, man, it's, it was it's it was fucking, fucking hard. It's such a fuck. You know, you said something. You go. It's like, listen. When when my mother died at fifteen, I had to make choices. I could have lived with family in California or Miami, but I was already two years in this motherfucking high school. My shit was just starting to get together. So I moved in with a family, man. And they provided electricity for me and a bed and food. But I had to do my own thing. And I thought my mom left Social Security and there was no prudential insurance and none of that shit. No, no, and no. I had to get a job and I learned. And I went without. I got into drugs. You know, I made my own bed, you know. But it was very, I think about it now how I still remember being 17 and owning a bookie. 800 bucks and it's Tuesday and you gotta give it to him on Thursday I look back a lot too and wonder how the fuck did I survive me too you know especially being shot and being through all the bullshit that I went I through I was never shot I was just hunted they just <laughs> never got me they were hunting for me well, they just I mean, never got me and shit <laughs> I mean, you and then it's a girl, so you really don't expect girl to go through girls to go through all that bullshit. You know, I was in a, a very abusive relationship. I'm here, I am, uh, fifteen with two kids, and this man like twenty three years old, married with a wife at home with his second baby, and I, I'm uh, well, he just had his second baby, and I'm on, I'm on, I'm on his fourth baby because I'm having my son by him. So you know, it was, it was fucking rough. It was some. I look back sometime, and it scared the shit out of me. Honestly, your heart like, beats. Yeah, like writing this book brought up so much shit that oh, I it's, locked it's, out. It sucks dick, don't it? Writing yeah. a book sucks I mean, dick, don't it? <laughs> I think sucking dick is a little bit better than writing this oh book. Oh my God. <laughs> Fucking, did I tell you what happened? I had three chapters, two chapters ready to go. I had one more. 
for the fucking thing you got to give them, and the website went out of business. And I didn't save it. I didn't back it up on cloud. So I waited until I, I just hired a dude. I went and got a fucking Pro Mac, and I went to work, and every day I do a thousand words. And you I mean, writing one now? A thousand words. I got to have this done by the end of August, at least three chapters for the motherfucking proposal, man. This has yeah. taken me three fucking years, but it's basically because the chapter he wants me to write is is hell. Is hell. It's from 79 to 85. Those are my hell years. I got a thousand good stories and I got a thousand bad stories. Yeah. That I thought I never had a thought think about again. That's and those feelings. Yes. Those the, feelings. You know what? Because I had a, uh, a lady by the name of Janine Amber Rota with me. Well, she did all the writing. I told the story. I, I, you know, I like being honest. I have to give her credit. She did a fucking remarkable job with helping me write this, you know, helping me write this book. But um, <clears throat> uh, it just, it brought up so much shit that I, I didn't talk about. It brought up so much feeling that I had buried it. I mean, it was so many, <coughs> it was so many times we had to stop the interview and we would cry together. Like when yeah, I got I'm into the stories um, of with the kid's father and, and, you know, the biggest issue that I realized is like, wow, I'm 15, pregnant with two kids. I mean, got two kids by a married man and society don't give a fuck. You, they literally allowed this grown ass man to come to the hospital and sign my kid's birth certificate who's eight years older than me. Nobody ever questioned it. Nobody. And you know what? What gets me now? I'm 45 and I, I say to myself, Fuck, if I was a white girl, would that shit had happened? I truly believe that motherfucker would still be in jail. It was a different time. It was a different time. It was time. a different place. This country well, it, has it, changed it, in let 30 me tell you, years so much. Well, you can say that. It has changed a lot, even for the black community. But I still think that. I mean, I'm one of those lost calls. You don't hear a lot about what black women go through in you know, in the ghetto, like with teen pregnancy and stuff like that. They don't give a fuck about people like me. People like me was supposed to, you know, we never rise to the top. I think that's how they kind of see it. So I think that's why people are so shocked. They're like, yeah, two fucking kids at 15 and you didn't use drugs and you this and you that. I mean, I'm like, come on. Even even the hospital in the black community should have done something when I had that first kid by that, Let me by that man. Something. What do you think happened after you had the first child, if the child was three months old, you had thought about what's happened, you, your frame of mind's a little different. If you had picked up the phone and dialed 911, let me ask you, what do you think would have happened? What year was this? 1986. What do you think would have happened? <coughs> well, I mean, I, I'm 14, so I'm supposed to have a parent that was supposed to be taking care of me for, for once. And it was a caseworker involved that wanted my mama to do something, but she didn't do shit. Now, times have changed a lot now where the the, 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 the states will st step in and say, no, nah, bitch, this ain't going down. Something like ain't that. right. Something ain't right. He's fucking 50 and you're 20 and you're 18. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, is that I'm, the I'm, grandpa? Yeah, exactly. So I'm 14 and got a baby by a 21-year-old man. That is fucking ridiculous. Can I ask you, uh, And because there's obviously racism in the world, but is it a racism thing, or do you think it's a money issue? I like, think it's a society issue. I don't, think it's, ra I don't issue. think it's racism. I just think it's, you know, like, it's like it's like you can meet a white person that don't know what the fuck go on on the other side of the track with other people, other than people that look like them. And they don't want to know. And they don't want to know. But I'm going to tell you something, just to put, and I'm not protecting the white man. But I gotta state my case here if I'm gonna speak up. Yeah. In 1983, and I've told you this story. I was a 20 year old kid, and I got a job in a warehouse. That's the best I could do. Ten an hour, you stock pipe, electrical thing, and we had to load three trucks. And there was a dude that was maybe at the time 38 to 40. His wife was 16. And she would ride in the truck with her. She was a scandal, retarded white girl. And, you know, I worked with him for a couple of months. And one day I had to go on a delivery with him. And I asked him, how is this? And he goes, I, I, I told, the parents gave it to me. They signed the rover. We have a child together. This motherfucker was 40. She was barely 16 or 15, man. 
That is so Every up. And everybody on this job site knew the situation, but they also knew that this dude just did like 12 years in prison and just got out like four years early for like murder or something. And the guy had a heart of gold. <laughs> that, was his, that, that was his only flaw. It sounded like he had a hard dick to yeah. me, Joey. No, I don't no, know no. about I mean, hard to go. When you talk to him, you could see no. the fucking that he wasn't all there. Uh, you could see that he probably got hit in the head with a kid with a rock or he played football <laughs> without yeah, a helmet. Yeah, he more than talking about somebody but gave him no, too. But listen, nobody, but nobody investigated to see if somebody really gave him that 16-year-old girl. Never. He worked there for years. Even after I quit, I was still friends with the people there because I did drugs with them, bought drugs with them, and we would always talk about them. And he was solid. He was on time. He did his delivery. So <laughs> nobody asked questions. Most child molesters are solid and on time until you Listen, catch it. Listen, in 1970-something, Led Zeppelin, Jimmy Page, traveled with a 14-year-old girl across the country that was a runaway and fucked her for years. <sighs> Till today, they, they're saying that they should have charged them with statutory rape. There's a thousand situations in this country. You know, thousands. It's fucking crazy. What the? And some people go to jail. And some people fucking Well, it's, it's a lot better now because if you tried this shit today. Yeah. I mean, look at today, R. Kelly. He got, he tried, they about to lock his ass up for uh, 18 years. What did he do? What is going He got a coat somewhere. <laughs> Speaking of R. Kelly, the cops are coming and shit. <laughs> <laughs> look at R. Kelly. R. Kelly's spirit somewhere. Uh, R. Kelly done picked up. They okay, say, so let's do the whole biography of R. Kelly here. Because I want to be part of the black community tonight. <laughs> I just the sent black my. Community I, mad just, at him I right just now. sent my 23 and over package. I'm waiting for the results, you know, the DNA test. <laughs> you want to know if you need to be mad at R. Kelly. That's and what you they need tell to you, know. And they tell you what you're going to die from. Damn. <laughs> like they, they do the DNA thing and they can be cardiovascular <coughs> or diabetes. Oh, why do you want to know that? Because what the fuck, dog? I, want, I really want to know the origin of who the fuck I am. Because some oh, dude man. about two years ago fucked with my head. He said he did a trace and I'm related to a Sicilian lieutenant in Sicily in 19 fucking 10. And I look at the dude's picture, and I do look like I could be his nephew. But I look at my father. I look like him. I look like my mother. I look at, when I was when I was a kid, I saw a picture of my mother's family. But in those days, uh, their family is really what you call to the Ligeno in Cuban, which means they have part Indian blood in them. When Columbus <laughs> went to Cuba, he killed a bunch of Indians. But some of them lived and fucked some white Cubans. <laughs> and the white Cubans <laughs> fucked some black slaves. Isn't it wonderful when you mix? It really is. So Cuba's just one big mix. I well, wanna... Black people too? Listen, Everybody's is one big mix. You know me, dog. I, I'm, an, I'm, as on, I'm as honest as I can. When the first time I saw a picture of my sister, like I didn't remember my sister when I left Cuba. But when I was like six, my mother came home running. I got school pictures from Cuba, your sister take a look at it and I saw that dark skin I was like mm -hmm. <laughs> I got questions but I ain't gonna ask them right? <laughs> I never said nothing Wait, you know what I have a brother who's we know this biracial but we supposed to have the same daddy <laughs> and my brother is fucking blacker than these headsets my my daddy was blacker than these headsets but my brother is fucking biracial as hell I mean, you can tell he's fucking everybody. When I show you his baby picture, everybody think he's a white little girl. Really? Yes, but nobody ever say you know good damn well that's one your fucking daddy. Is there a stigma and like, um, like among black people, like, uh, like with skin color? Because I'm well, like, light skinned brothers. Remember Pierre? That was his claim to fame. Yeah, who's light skinned brother? You don't like being a light skinned brother and shit. Well, well, light skinned brother was really popular. I think dark skin is right now. Everybody like the dark skin. Ikri Abbas. What's his name? Abbas. Idris Elba? Yeah, Idris Elba. Yeah, we, they like him like Idris Elba. That's, that's like a 10 well, point on the Joe Diaz. Let me tell you something, Miss Pack. I thought you were trying to say an I, opera I, singer. I, I got to tell you this story, Miss Pack, because you ain't going to believe this. What? So I'm six. I see the picture of my sister. She's a little dark skinned. Mm -hmm. My godmother's dark, who, who was my Santa Maria godmother, and she pretty much, I, was, I lived at a house. You know, she would cut a chicken <laughs> and cook it up, the whole fucking thing. <laughs> You know, and Orlando Cepeda was a famous baseball player. So I was like, man, some of these Cubans are black, you know. All right, fuck it. I'll live with it. We get to Miami one time. And again, my mother comes to the hotel. She goes, look at the picture of our family. Look at our cousins. And she opened up that fucking portrait. 
and there was 30, it looked like an NBA basketball team <laughs> with one little white trainer uh -huh. in the corner. And I told her, I said, listen, I don't know what fucking voodoo you're trying to play on me. That ain't my fucking family. So your 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 mom was late. I was I was I must have been eight. We were in Miami. We were at my godmother's house. It was like seven in the morning. She was always. Well, excited. Cuba's out. Cuba's got dark skin. But at that time, I didn't know for sure. I'm so, looking. But you thinking they was black people? I'm looking at a picture of my sister. She's dark skinned oh I'm looking at my mother. I'm looking at my dad. Am I adopted? Am I, you know what I'm saying? Like something ain't right here. That my sister's fucking black, and I didn't want. And I knew how kids they come out of the pussy. I knew all that shit. But I didn't have the balls to ask. So I lived with that little stigma for two years that, okay, I got a black sister. <laughs> that, that's just the way life is, okay? You, not one time it crossed your mind, maybe your mama pussy was on borrow that day? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> so now she shows me this fucking, the 70s. Oh. They would send you these pictures in like a portrait uh -huh. style, and you'd open them up. When I look, they look at your cousins, and I saw all them black people. I looked at I said, listen, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. These are not my cousins. Miss Pat, she threw a beat on me. Like left, right, left, right, left, <laughs> right. Kicked she to the threw stomach. A black, she, she threw a black Ripped the shirt on off me. Yeah, like to go in the fucking room and don't come out. That's your family when you accept it. Come out of the room. What do you think? You're fucking white, you little piece of shit. She <laughs> just went off. You got black fucking skin. Look at your father. Look at your fucking sister, stupid. And after that, beating, fuck it, I'm black. Well, welcome you to the other side. Welcome to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Was you at the soul food restaurant that got kicked shot up today? No. You know what, man? I don't need soul food out here. I gave up. I, I, I haven't gotten any good soul food in California. You're not going to get it. I only get it, it and, down and you know south in Atlanta. And it's very overpriced. Everything out here is damn overpriced. Let me tell you something. There's a little joint <laughs> that they've turned, they've converted four or five times. Lee used to always go to a joint called Skinny Kitchen. When Lee used to go to first started going to Skinny Kitchen, there was a black joint next to it. Do you not remember Lee? You, we, you took me there. I'm pretty sure. Remember with the hash. We had three pieces of chicken. <laughs> Listen, Miss Pat, three pieces of chicken and two side orders, thirty six dollars. Thirty six dollars. Listen what to the fuck? me and Lee looked at each other. I don't listen. I don't give a fuck. I know you're trying to make a living, but when you leave there, you go. The chicken was fantastic. But you think about it, the receipt, you go, $36. Wait a minute, it was, it, two plates was $36. Me and Lee, $36, and they were two-piece ch chicken dinners. Like with two pieces of chicken and macaroni and cheese or a little piece of fucking corn. So it, that it place closed down. closed down. Of course. Then across the street on the same side, 50 yards up, there used to be a hot dog stand. They got lines of black people standing out there in North Hollywood, right, motherfucker? You talking about pink? No, 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 no. Oh. Right now, if you go to North Hollywood, three blocks from here, that main street, there's a movie theater, Lemley. Right next to Lemley, there's a little fucking place that has 15 tables. It's a diner. It was closed forever. It's a diner that's closed forever, and they got tremendous fucking fried chicken in there. But Miss they, they open? They open right now until 10. But Miss Pat, I gotta tell you something. My wife brought it home. My wife's from the South. We ate it. We had a good time. And at the end, my wife goes, well, How much do you think that cost me? Like, well, maybe $28. Boom, 50 bucks. We both, because we're both Lee's fried chicken motherfuckers. I go to Nashville. I get in that car. I head east. And there's a Lee's fried chicken. That it's blacker than black in there. I go in there. I get 22 pieces of chicken for $2. You know what I'm saying? God, 50 damn. fucking dollars for, for, for a half a chicken over there. <laughs> well, how much do you think they're paying rent at that place? Oh, they're paying tremendous rent over there. But look at Roscoe's went down the fucking toilet. They oh, closed? it was terrible. No, Roscoe's in Hollywood is done. I hear that Roscoe's on whatever still has a little Pico. bit of dignity left. There's a server yeah. at the one in Hollywood who listens, and he's very nice, but the... Uh, the food was terrible. The food's terrible. And I've heard I've that never, from various I've people. I've never liked uh, Roscoe. I, I like Roscoe's. The, the first time I went there, I ain't going to lie nobody. That was the first time I tasted a piece of chicken and maple syrup. My dick got hard. <laughs> but I know it ain't good for you. You can't eat chicken with maple syrup on it every goddamn day. <laughs> Nothing good is going to come from eating chicken with maple syrup every uh, fucking day. I'm glad I didn't bring you no chicken with maple syrup. <laughs> the issue with it now is like it's faster than McDonald's. They, they have it ready. Yeah, it's not we, good. We had it. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've tried it, but I didn't. I never liked it when I first came out here. 
Now, next time I go to Atlanta, do I go to Gladys? You go- no, Glad's no. closed. Her son fucked her over. Really? I think so. You Last go time to, I went there, said there was a line. That's why I didn't go down there. Yeah, go to go, get somebody to take you to Riverdale, Georgia. That's what. That's right outside Atlanta, <laughs> by the airport, and it's a place over there called Annie Lores, and that shit is good. Let me tell you, the best soul food is if you go to a place and they ain't got no roaches, the food ain't no good. Listen. Roaches are gonna only hang around where the food is good. So are you like supposed to see roaches immediately when you walk in? No, but uh, I haven't seen any of Annie Lores either. But the food's so good, you just know some roaches well, in there is, somewhere. This is my <laughs> take on it. You ready? Yeah. When I see a black style restaurant with white decor, I tend to stay away from it. The best food I've ever had. Raggedy. I thought, raggedy. No. This motherfucker was frying pork chops on the street with white bread and hot sauce. He must have weighed four and a quarter. <laughs> he had a, a guinea t-shirt on. He was sweating his armpits on those pork chops. That do be some good ass food I, at the I, gas I, oh station. Oh my god, I was three ninety and I must have ate eight of those pork chops on white bread with hot sauce. Oh my god, they were that's the best goodies. pork chops I ever had in my life. So I, I don't believe, eat pork chops anymore, but that's some I good know. shit. I don't eat pork chops either, but those Puerto Rican style, black style pork chops. Oh, Ain't nothing shit. like it. Ain't, you know, that's the best food on the side of the street. No, no, that's it. That's it. All that. Gas station. Once you see a black style restaurant trying to act like fucking uh, Wolfgang Try, Puck, yes. I don't go in there. That's a waste of your time. You're going to get a small serving. I uh, hate uh, going places where you yeah. get fucking small servings of no, food. No, no, no. And no, you no. want all my money. I'm like, yeah. what the rest of my fucking Houston food got at? Good, Houston got good spots, too. Miss Pat, you got so angry when we went for tacos after the podcast last time? Because you're used to East Coast tacos. Uh-huh. And I think we went, and they, and they give you like the little disc. Oh, my God. And it's like it's like a fucking appetizer. Well, mm-hmm. when you took, what did you take? Her? Cactus. And what'd she eat? I think she got like Nothing. A, <laughs> <laughs> that little shit, I don't remember tasting so, it. We'll go tonight. Yeah, it was it was like those super tacos, fucking. Listen, those tacos are good. Those carne asada tacos. I don't eat pork. <laughs> I don't eat pork, especially if somebody else cooks it. I wanna, okay. I want to witness it. I'm Cuban. It's an insult. Okay. Those carne inside the tacos with that. How many did I end up eating? But so, you three or four? Get, you got to get it with the avocado and the cheese. You got to work on that keto diet. You know what I'm saying? The keto diet? The avocado, that's a good fat. Okay. Keeps they said it. Yeah. They said a lot of shit is a good fat until yeah. you gain weight. Right. No, I understand. You don't listen. You're just going to. Anyway, let's get back to Miss <laughs> Pat having a fucking kid in the fucking ambulance. That's what people want to hear. Not what the fuck is going on in Roscoe's. Nobody gives a fuck. You go to Yelp. That's Lee's favorite. My new podcast. It's great to see you, first of all. Hell you look beautiful. I've heard, you know, about your success over the year. I read Thank your you. tweets, fucking with motherfuckers. <laughs> and, uh, I'm always going at people. I mean, thank y'all so much. I mean, the podcast family. A lot of this shit wouldn't happen without you guys. <coughs> you know, back in the day, a lot of comics got their breaks from Johnny Carson. I got to say, these podcasts has truly been my fucking Johnny oh, Carson. Who you think you're dealing with, Joy Bananas? I wouldn't have had dick if it wasn't a podcast. <laughs> you know why? We came out here and told them the truth. I don't give a fuck what I tell them no more. You can't give I'm gonna a fuck. die in fucking ten years. They're they're gonna know the whole you fucking story. You sound like my brother-in-law. Yeah, because it's true. They're gonna know the whole fucking story. <coughs> I just me. lost. And, um, I you know I, my I'm a big football fan, so I went to the Falcons game. I went so great for you for. Oh fuck you, most uh, Jesus Yeah, he Christ. got on that Boston fucking shirt. <laughs> well, Jesus Christ! I got Super Bowl tickets uh, from Lee Daniels. You know who does Empire because he's the one that's. Uh, Behind my behind the TV show, they developing for me. Oh man, I tell you, it was the worst night of my life. Ooh. Not only did my Falcons lose, my um, at at we was winning the first two quarters, three and, quarters. Uh, was it three? Most, yeah, yeah. I, most of the night we was winning, and it was so fucked up because when we started to lose, I went in the bathroom and hid. And my husband texts me, and he said, my sister just had a massive heart attack oh, watching a game. And I'm like, fuck your oh sister. My God. I'm about to have a heart attack. The Falcons is losing the, about to lose the Super Bowl. Then I get a text back that she died. Oh, and Jesus. it was so fucked up because she died. And she died the night of the Falcons losing the Super Bowl. So I'm crying, but I don't know who the fuck I'm crying for. And, and I, I, told my, I told my husband, I said, I tell people, I say, you might think it's a bad, bad that I lost my sister-in-law that night, but you got to look at it like this. At least she died in the third quarter, I mean the fourth quarter, and she think the Falcons won the Super Bowl. She didn't stay alive to the whole shit. 
I'm the bitch that left there with a heart broken. I almost had a heart attack. What she died over? Just to. She was cheering for the Falcons. <laughs> Tom Brady gave her a heart attack. Fuck yeah, Tom Brady gave everybody a heart attack. <laughs> fucking Tom Brady killed her. <laughs> so I, now I hate Ronald Reagan and I hate fucking Tom Brady. <laughs> Ronald Reagan killed my dog and Tom Brady killed my sister in law. Damn. So she was cheering and she um she had a massive heart attack and died. You really um, like football though, right? You really I follow. fucking love football. I thought you were a Raven fan for you some reason. You ain't thought I was no motherfucking Raven fan. I'm all the way in Atlanta. I thought you were a Ray Lewis fan and shit. Ray Lewis, you done lost your goddamn mind. Come on, I thought you were running with him and slinging and shit with Ray no, Lewis. I ain't like you know what Ray Lewis uh, the black community is not liking his ass right now. What did he do now? He just he, uh, that whole Colin Kaepernick thing, you know, he he's saying I don't know what he's saying, but he's all against Colin Kaepernick because he's decided to protest, you know, for what he thought was right. And this is America. You should be able to protest when you feel a certain way about a situation. It's not illegal to protest. Well, that motherfucker ain't got a job now. Who? Kaepernick. Who? Kaepernick, whatever his name Kaepernick. is. Kaepernick. Kaepernick. No, he ain't got no, he ain't he ain't got no a, fucking job. He don't have a job. This is the NFL. We live in a corporate fucking world. Mm -hmm. Before you go into any profession, I suggest you read that dude I did the longest yard with. That dude had tears coming out of my eyes. What's that white boy that fucking did the longest yard that was a linebacker in Oklahoma that left early? And then fucking the uh, Warner Brothers gave them, gave them 25 mil, three movies. He did the first one. Huh. The he kept guy? them over. Yeah. Then Seattle knew he had bad shoulders, but they got a million dollar insurance on him. From Lloyd to London, and they signed him, and they put him up in Seattle. And then the NFL hated him. They fucking hated him. So he would tuck his shirt out. They would find him his game check. And he kept doing it. I mean, the stories of the NFL, they don't fuck around. So Copernicus, I understand what you... Ka Kaepernick. Whatever your fucking name is. <laughs> this is America, and I stand I stand what you believe for, but there's different ways of doing it in different situations. I mean, you know, it's, I look at it like this. I look at it like this. And I ain't mad and at Copernicus. It's, 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 it's I get it. Fucking Kaepernick. Whatever the fuck his name is, you know that I understand where he's coming from. But you also understand now that with the world you're well, going Well, when into. do you bring attention to black, uh, the police killing black people? When is a good time to bring attention to that? Because it seems like, you know, it's, it's you, you know, you don't have to worry about it if it's not in your community. And, you know. I drive 35. I'm Cuban. I'm white. And I drive in L.A. worried. Especially at night. Yeah. If you but, don't I think mean, I'm worried in L.A. This is supposed to be America. You should, yes. you should be able to. You should be able to. This is what's great about this country. This is what's great about this country. You should be able to protest and 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 you know get for what you believe in. There's never a right time. You know what I'm saying? It ain't like he went out there like Ray Lewis and killed somebody. Man, ain't never committed a crime. All he did was a silent protest, and he did it two weeks before they even noticed it. I mean, you know, they want to say you disrespected the national anthem, but I mean, but being black in America, I have black kids. You know, it's a, it's a it's America. It's, this country is great. I love I love this country. But then again, you have to think about how they treat young black men in this country. It's scary being a black mama today. It is fucking scary. And I say this all the time. I rather fight breast cancer than be a black parent of a young black man in this country. Because it's something that I worry about. It's like a lot of you don't know if your child is next. And, so and when you know, do we speak you know, up? You know what, Miss Pat? The last fucking five years, some wild shit's been going on. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And thank God, you know, sometimes you go, I hate cameras. But now motherfuckers are catching But they don't even care. Camera. They don't even care. Don't even the care. cameras don't, don't even care. get the, the cameras. Jury doesn't I mean, do that. I don't even talk about all other people that have been shot. One thing that really fucked me up, Joey, is it, just Google it. They shot a 12 year old boy in a park in, in Cleveland, Ohio, for playing with a toy gun. He just out there playing like any other 12 year old was. If that don't say fuck black people, nothing else will ever will. That's what scares me. We're living in wild times. Do you see in and you and, and listen and tell me I'm lying. I got a four and a half year old. And if you don't think at one point in the night when I got up to pee, 
I worry about her future. You fucking kill. You, you, you know. We all worried about. It. I mean, we worried don't know where we fuck. head in that. I mean, worried all of us together. Well, where we this fuck? Did you see like twice in the past couple of months in Baltimore? They their own. Uh, oh my god! Secu- the fuck, their own the cameras the have caught them planning drugs, drugs on people. I'm like, come on, police twice. officer. I, when I sold drugs, I wasn't this scared of the police. No. They was fucking nice people. And it, and you cannot clump them all together because I have friends that police officer. You cannot clump them all together because there are some good police That's some officers. Good cops. No, it's, no, no, it's some no. bad apples in every fucking job. It's some bad firefighters, some bad teachers, for bad police officer. I mean, but it it it, 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 it scares me when I get pulled over. I'm scared than a motherfucker. It scares me. This is what scares me. That they hire these. Don't they fucking do evaluations on these police well, officers? Well, some reason these nut bags Listen, are you, passing. You've been to you've been locked up. Yeah, yeah, okay. I've been locked now you've up. been county or locked up state. I've been state. Okay, when you go to state, you're in county for two, three weeks. Shit, they months. talk to you, okay? Mm-hmm. Then they transfer you to a fucking evaluation joint, correct? Yeah. They draw blood. They check you out. They look in your fucking monkey. They look in your <laughs> dick. They look in your asshole to make sure you don't got a set of dice in that motherfucker. <laughs> a set of dice. Right? Then, uh, then. I don't think I can fit no dice then, in my asshole. Then they do give you an aptitude test. Remember that day? Mm-hmm. Where they ask you what two plus two is four? Where's Africa? What what <laughs> fucking, what, fucking what president got shot in the movie theater? <laughs> you know, they ask I you. I dropped all, out of school. I can ask another right. fucking thing. and then they get <laughs> deep in your shit. Yeah, and I the third it's there. it's five days, and I forget what it's called now because we're talking about it. Okay, so they do, they do this one test on you where they talk to you. We don't. You don't remember. I remember not vividly. Yeah, you older than me. They, they just lock my ass up. They talk to you. A psych evaluation talks to you. Then you take a test, and then you start putting holes and shit, and then you go back and talk to that motherfucker, and, th- and then you go to where your classification goes. You end up going to where you're going, but that paperwork goes to the feds, and that paperwork is typed in into a, a database, okay, with your DNA, with your fingerprints. With your tendencies, with what they think you'll do, what what options you have. I mean, you know, but it's a computer doing the percentages oh, of yeah. your, Evaluation. what's the word? Not a, Recidivism? Recidivism, whatever the fucking word is, okay? They break it down. Mm-hmm. And that report goes to your prison counselor. How accurate do you think they are? It changed my life when I heard what it said on that piece of paper, which you're not supposed to find out. Your attorney is supposed to file a motion. And if the state doesn't want to give it to you, I found out because I kept busting the counselor's ass. <laughs> and he kept telling me, you don't want to know what's on that paper. What did they say? You was crazy. They said that uh, at that time I'm 25, I'm 26. And from the age of 16, I hadn't stopped robbing. Some people I knew, drug dealers, and, you know, when you're not on drugs, all that shit, you start thinking about it, right? When you're clean, yeah. that's when you start going, oh, shit, I almost paid a $1,000. Oh, let me go shoot this bitch. <laughs> no, let me go. I got to call her now and go, Miss Pat, you know what happened. I know I know when I gave you the money, you were cracked up, baby, but you know how it is, Miss Pat. So you remember all this shit you did, and uh, what the fuck are we talking about here? So I kept breaking his balls. You talking about some uh, evaluation? Right. So, uh, my police so I kept them. breaking his balls. So I'm feeling bad that I was robbing people and breaking into people's houses and drug dealers and shit. So I asked him, dog, tell me what it says on there. And he kept telling me, you don't want to know. You don't want to know what it says on there. What the fuck did he say? And one day he broke down. He goes, all right, motherfucker, I'll tell you what it says. He goes on there that if I had something you wanted, I can't trust you. If you really wanted it, you'd take it from me. Hmm. And I was cracked, Miss Pat. I was cracked. I went back to that room crying. I'm like, I'm just a fucking thief. <laughs> and I avoided him, and one day he came to me. He goes, why you been avoiding me? You didn't want to hear what you heard, did you? He goes, but you didn't hear what I was saying. He goes, I didn't tell you you were a thief. I was telling you that if you want to do something, you can do it. Go do your thing. You got, you know what I'm saying? Like, he encouraged me. I took it as I was a thief. So he fucking cracked me, Miss Pat. 
but all that paperwork goes to the feds. And they tapped that in. At that time, maybe my shit slipped. It was 88. The computer system <laughs> was wasn't no. on tap. <laughs> but now you go into a database, and as soon as a crime similar to that happens, your name pops up. Yeah. You know, they have systems now that's amazing. Once they got that fingerprint on you, they got you in there for narcotics, of felony. They got your hair. What? They got everything. I don't know. I don't. I, that's a good question. How do these bad police officers get police officer jobs? Well, okay. In 1979, 78, the Cuban population was growing so much in Miami that the fucking city council had a meeting real quick, real quick, dog, and said, look, we ain't going to get federal funding unless we start hiring some more motherfucking Cubans. So they went after these kids. And they never did background checks on their jewelry records. And they hired 20 cops. And this became fucking huge. This was the 80s when cocaine was blossoming. Mm -hmm. They knew information on you, dog. They would pull you over, take, open up your trunk, take your coke, shoot you in the head, put you in the trunk, and leave you on the side of the road. God damn. At the end of the week, these guys had a warehouse. Full of coke. Full of coke and money. And they would play cards with a kilo on the table, with a knife in the kilo. And they would just snore for hours. These guys were lieutenants on an anti-drug unit. <laughs> so they had all the info. And all four of them, if you put river cops up on the thing, not like a video, there's got to be an article about the Miami river cops. When they came out, they went to prison like in the 80s, and they came out in the late 90s, and I was doing coconut grow then. And people were putting Coconut Grove, yeah. People were putting posters up of these cops trying to get a petition not to let them move back into their communities. God damn. That's how fucking crazy these cops were. Mm. They even did a movie about these motherfuckers. So this shit starts like this. This is how it starts. You know, it starts like this and every, you know, uh, a corrupt cop is somebody who has three kids, a girlfriend. Okay, three kids and a girlfriend. <laughs> okay. And guess what? And guess what, Miss Pat? You know, tell me the truth, Miss Pat. You a street motherfucker, okay? Yep. You a street motherfucker, okay? You ever watch the show Miami Vice? Oh, the first one, the real one, yeah. The, Not the all the these remake shits, yeah. Yeah, Lee, in Miami Vice, this is how it went down. I knew Lee and you knew Miss Pat. Okay? Gotcha. Okay? I walk in to this office right now with you. You're in for 10%. Miss Pat sells me two kilos of Coke. In front of Miss Pat, I take a violet with a chemical, and I take a little bit of Coke, and I shake it. To make sure it's real. To make sure it's real. And if it comes up purple, I give Miss Pat the money, and we shake hands. Let me tell you something. That shit only happens in the movie. If Miss Pat is Miss Pat, Miss Pat's going to want that motherfucker to open up that kilo and do three lines of coke. Or maybe do a fourth and drink half that bottle of tequila. She wants to know what this motherfucker's about before she moves in on giving him two fucking kilos, okay? That only happens <laughs> in fairy tale land. So these cops become addicted to drugs. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that shit, Lee. So let's say I'm going after Lee Syatt. Lee Syatt's a fucking big time coke dealer. I get in with Lee Syatt. If Lee Syatt goes to a club and what do I tell Lisa? I, I don't do blow. You're not going to trust me, Lisa. I, yeah. So I got to snort coke. So after you get arrested, they put me in a rehab. I clean up. They withdraw the trial, the uh, witnesses for 45 days. They get all the drugs out of my system. They mm -hmm. shave me. They change my hair color. They put a suit on me. And they make me go in there with a police uniform on. How's that one for you? Holy shit. And there you have it, my friend. Now, Miss Pat, in all your days on the street, you ever sell crack to a motherfucker that you didn't see with a pipe in his mouth? No. No, okay. You can always tell the police. I mean, yeah. when you, when yeah. you sold oh, enough please. drugs, uh, when you sold enough drugs, you can pretty... Because the police, no matter how much they try to blend in somewhere, they don't blend in. They don't in. blend in. I remember seeing one one time in a... Uh, <laughs> he had a... Uh, he, he was undercover, and he had a baby seat in the back seat. And he had another guy in the car with him. And his partner jump out and come down to buy the drugs. But he pulled down too quick. 
So I said, either these motherfuckers gay with his baby seat in the back, uh, they're the police. And they was the fucking police. And you know how as a drug dealer, you could ask them, you the police, they supposed to say yes or no. And he's like, you the police? And then one, I remember one of the little young guys was like, we'll shoot your ass. And he left real quick. And I was like, this motherfucker come back with a whole unit of bitches. I grabbed my kids and went home. Everybody got busted except me. Yeah. There was a time there where I had a dude that was working me that ratted. And he was working me, man. And I caught on after the second time. What is working me? Working me. You know. Okay, so. I know Miss Pat five years from the street. Miss Pat, what up? I got to, you know, I give Miss Pat Oh, working? He was undercover? No, he gets busted. I'm a coke dude. Also, when I get busted. And they say to me, listen, what we want is Miss Pat. Miss Pat selling major coke. I try to put him off. I like Miss Pat, man. I love Miss Pat. Come on, go to Miss Pat and tell Miss Pat that you want to buy two ounces. Two ounces is what they could get you on and give you time and conviction. Yeah. Okay, so now, you know, I'm Joey Diaz, Miss Pat. He's been coming over the house for years buying a gram, and he's always $5 short. Now this motherfucker wants two ounces cash with fresh $50 bills. Ooh. Nigga, please. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. That's how they get you. Sometimes. <laughs> when a crackhead show with yeah. a lot of money, you're like, where the fuck you get this money from? You ain't never bought over $50 worth of dope. You know what I'm saying? You oh, hit the lottery that. bit? That's how they used to come at me. So for months, you've been buying an eight ball and asking me for $20 off because we're friends. And all of a sudden, you show up here wanting two ounces. Then the second time, no, the first time you showed up wanting like a half ounce. And he was shaking. Uh-huh. And then the second time, he goes, I, I want to buy two ounces, but do me a favor, I'll give you the cash. Let's go outside. So they were up 50 yards with the fucking things. Monoculars and shit, yeah. No, and I just went outside. And I said, nah, I don't want to talk about it. It's too cold. And right there, right there, and I go, let me call you later. As soon as he fucking left, I took all those fucking scales all those aluminum foils, I got them all the way out of there. I had a job as a security guard at a hotel. <laughs> and they gave me. You were a, you, you a security guard? At two what? hotels, dog, hey. in 1984. And you a drug dealer? <laughs> I, was, I was a fucking. I was, well, at least you paid listen taxes. Listen to me. What fucking drug dealer? I was doing everything robbing, slinging. It was crazy. I was a, a security Joy, driver. Joy, you make me sound like a fucking nun. Oh, my God. I was 21 <laughs> fucking years old, man. And I was just watching people check into the hotel room. <laughs> Waiting to rob them? I'd wait till they go to the hotel room, and I'd be right there when they registered. Do you want to use this safe? Now nah, we got travelers check. Bam. When they go skiing, you got 10 hours to go in their room. You go in their room and cook a meal and come back. And then we'll never fucking know it, man. It's fucking crazy. They were probably really excited when they saw you. They're like, oh, this place is good security. He's, I can tell he's like really looking over us. <laughs> and the security guys were one robbing the there shit was out like, of you. There was like eight guys on security, so they never fucking... You know, know. that's why I don't leave my shit in a hotel. Me room. neither. I, tell I don't people leave all personal time. shit. I take and my I always, computer and, with me. And I always put... I don't want no maid in the fucking room either. No, I don't want there that There ain't bitch a maid allowed in my room They always throw away my fucking days. eyelashes. That's the biggest problem I have with housekeeping. Dog. I think the Mexican housekeeping, don't, they don't wear eyelashes. So I don't know what the fuck they think they are, but they're reusable. And when I take them off, they throw the bitches away. That is the most fucked up shit you ever saw. Let me tell you my problem. I have made more hotels give me $5 for eyelashes. Than I was like, look, the bitch do wear my eyelashes. I want my motherfucking eyelashes back. Oh, my God. Listen to me, dog. I got a fucking ear problem. When I was a kid, I put a bean <laughs> in my right ear. And I didn't tell my mother, so they had to go in my ear, and they found the bean. So my ears all fucked up. Did it sprout? Kind of. Kind of. Well, that's better than having roaches in your it was a, ear. It was a bean made of wood from a game called Please Don't Spill the Beans. Oh, it wasn't even a real fucking bean? No, but my mother kept putting hot oil in that motherfucker, and it sprouted. And they took it out of my ear. But anyway, today, I, when I fly, when I take showers, I got to be careful. If water goes in my ear and stays... Cause if I fly the next day, then I go I go deaf. So I gotta go to a doctor. They blow it out and put powder in there. It gets like a fungi in there if I leave the water in there. So I gotta put earplugs in my every time I take a shower. 
Do you know I put the two earplugs in the shower and the fucking maid would throw the earplugs out every fucking time? Mm-hmm. I went through two boxes of earplugs in like eight weeks in the hotel, dog. I know they they do the stupidest shit. They don't they don't empty the trash can, but they'll throw your fucking eyelashes away. No, I stopped letting them in. I couldn't do it. I don't no let more. them in no more either. I was like, I don't you, want you bitches, in my you bitches throw my shit away. I don't, I don't want nobody in the fucking room. No, and I, I don't, I'm the type of person like I get I throw my shit in the flow. So I don't want you looking at my dirty underwear. I don't. I mean, I fuck up a hotel room. Now I straighten it up at the end. But I will fuck up a hotel room. I throw everything on the floor. Everything out the suitcase. For however many days I'm there, when I when I'm finally leave, then I straighten it up. I throw the suitcase on the couch. I take the three outfits for the three nights. I lay them out nice. See, a woman I put don't the do socks that. right underneath, right? And I take the little security bag. I, I put the suitcase on the side. I put away my sleep apnea machine. I hook you got a sleep? Computer. I just gave us well a sleep apnea machine. Fuck yeah, I got a sleep apnea machine. That motherfucker flies right next to me. Man, I couldn't do that shit. I tried that bullshit. I mean, it's it's hard. How, but how bad is it, man? How bad is you it? You know what? I felt re- it's, <laughs> it's not sexy at all. You look so. so you. I mean, I mean, you, you still can't still have look that on, huh? You still look healthy. What numbers are you? What do you mean? What kind of numbers did you have? Did you do the sleep study? I, yeah, I did the sleep study. And what they gave tell me, you? I don't know what the fuck they gave me. You know I, what they told you. Tell me the truth. Don't I don't know. Me. They just said I had sleep apnea. They gave me this nice-ass machine. Okay. Uh, nice mask? Nice mask. Okay. And I just recently put it on Facebook and gave it to a neighbor. Okay, so how, what did they tell you, Miss They Pat? told me I stop a lot of time at night when I'm breathing. Well, what are you going to do about it, Miss Pat? Because now you got me all worried about I'm going to be sitting up sleeping like a vampire here. You know what I had to do? I had a fucking apartment that I paid seven twenty a month for. It was rent control. A one bedroom. Me and my girlfriend now, who's my wife now. Now let me tell you something. They built the building in 1922 before the war where they had water for years. I would go in there. I would take a pillow, Miss Pat, wrap it up in garbage bag. I put it behind me and I put the shower on real hot. I would sleep for six hours in that fucking shower. The paint would peel off the walls and shit. So what do you what? So that, you that, sleep with a mask now? Now I sleep with a mask. And Cause you change. snore a lot. At that time, I was four hundred pounds. You have lost some weight. I was doing cocaine. I was smoking cigarettes. My diet you was unhealthy. You stopped all that. Yeah, except smoking reefer. And, you know, Nothing we, wrong with weed. I think it's the no, best no, shit ever. Salute. Thanks to thanks for you know. I think it's the best shit ever. So, my numbers have gone down. I fell asleep today with ice on my knees. I was icing my knees. The baby was watching uh, the, something on the computer, and I had something on. I think I fell asleep for fifteen minutes. How much weight you lost? I have no since the beginning. Since I was four eighteen. Now I'm walking around between 298 and 303. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so that helped a lot. You, But I'm still no fucking Olympian. I still got to stop. Did it, did it, it, did it, let me ask you this. Did it make your sex life better? <sighs> Damn, you took a long deep breath when I said that one. My sex life got fucked up because of the cocaine use. Because for a long time, I was having sex with cocaine freaks. <laughs> okay, okay, from, from let's be honest here, from from 85 to 91, I was involved with a woman. Mm-hmm. And we got married and had a daughter, and then we got divorced. And after that, I became a comedian in 91. So from 93 to 2000, when I met my wife, it was, you know, and even before that, before I met, Kathy, it was 1983, 84, where I would just meet you. I knew Miss Pat. Me and you were having some cocktails, you know, and all of a sudden I'd give you a little bump of Coke. We're talking. Let's go back to your house and listen to Shaft. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We go back to your house, and next thing you know, it's two days later, and we're still eating each other out. You know what I'm what saying? What the fuck? Yeah, that, that type of <laughs> shit. Like, you know, two days. <laughs> Two I days later. <laughs> you, you need to change that character name. Yeah. I ain't eating nothing for no, two days. <laughs> I'm just saying to you that. You didn't see that coming, Miss Pat? I didn't it see was, that one coming. <laughs> that drug shit, that drug shit makes people go crazy. You know? I know. I got to need some. I, I tell you, I'm going through that with um, 
I have four kids now, four babies at my house, and uh, just ran off and left them. So I don't know what she out there eating, but she been gone almost a year and a half, almost two years. She called? No. She, you know what's fucked up? She started a new Facebook page, and I asked her to be my friend, and she blocked me. <laughs> That's fucked up. I always, uh, when I was a kid, there were cartoons, and every cartoon had, like, a kid running away from home, and he had a broomstick, and around the broomstick yeah, was a bag, bag tied like a sleep, like a punching bag, Lee. Right, yeah, like a handkerchief. A hobo, a hobo bag. Like a hobo. hobo bag, yeah. And you'd see kids walking down the street. And when I was like 12 or 13, I thought about it. I wanted to run away and move to French Lake, Indiana, where Larry Bird was from. And I'm like, oh, I'm, yeah. And I'm like, and th in those days, you had to map it out and shit. And I looked at the maps and I'm like, I'll hitchhike. At that time, I had a couple hundred in the bank. You know, but in your mind, it's like a fantasy when you're a kid that. One day you're gonna run away and people are gonna look for you and shit like that. And you're like, I ain't got the balls to run away. I got laundry. I got meatloaf twice a week, month. That's fucked up. When a child just runs away. Yeah. And they end up on the other side of the coast, on Hollywood Boulevard, not even prostituting, not even doing nothing bad. They meet another bunch of six kids that are homeless, and they live in like an old house. That's ready to get knocked down behind, you know. We used to live down the corner here. There was a house on the corner. The people sold it because they wanted to build uh, buildings there, like a apartment complex. Within a month, they had people, what do you call those people? Squatters. Squatters. And they had 12 What is squatters? I think it's when you just go in and live there when you don't have, like, a oh, yeah, claim yeah, to yeah, it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I have a friend uh, who, who lived in a different state. And when he went there, he didn't have enough money for rent. He he met someone, and they said, Do you, if, if you have $1,000, I can get you a place to live. They met, and when he, when he got there, they, she told him when the people come back. Like, it was just a house that, what, like, no one was at. No one had, like, been to in a while. She had, a, like, a fake deed, and she had keys, and... They said if the new if they ever if they ever sell it or something it was like previously foreclosed if they ever sell it or so you'll need to get out and he was there for months he paid it's her a thousand dollars it's fucked up Miss Pat so let's pretend life gets beautiful and you tell your husband and the children <laughs> listen we're like the Jacksons we're leaving Gary Indiana you know what I'm saying Plainfield Indiana <laughs> is, is it, aren't the Jacksons from Gary they're from Gary they're yeah. from Gary Yeah. you say listen we're enough of this Gary shit we're moving out there to Encino and they bought a house they bought a mansion mm -hmm. and you come out here that house is open the one that you just left is open Yeah. you tell your mom to drop by there once a week and make sure it's alright or your dad or your uncle or whoever and all of a sudden three weeks later they'll call you and they'll tell you there's people living in your house and these motherfuckers got rights. Ms. Yeah, Pat, I was just going to say that. Miss Pat, they got motherfucking rights and shit. If they're there for a certain amount of time, I don't know if it's... I think it might be in England. I think in England they have, like, a lot of rights. Like, like they actually get to stay it's in the house. fucked up, Miss Pat. With, they get to stay in the fucking house? In your house. How do you get them out? You got to, like, shit. I would drag the shit out of them yeah. some bitches. We put out a Monday podcast. We didn't pay Tony Bennett out of respect. I want to be around <laughs> to pick up the pieces. Hey, that's the music you listen to when, when you got a sugar daddy. Somebody no, this is the music I listen to. <laughs> My mom used to play this shit. But no, she that's the music I don't listen to if I had a rich sugar daddy <laughs> who had loafers in his pants in the water and you can see his ankles. As I It's that fantasy shit where somebody holding you with their hand in the palm of your back, spinning you around like you don't dance in other stars. And your weaves just flowing in the air. And you got on clean panties. Sounds nice. <laughs> don't that sound sexy? You <laughs> fucked it up till you said clean panties. I like a little stain in there. I like a little dirt in there. Something, you know what I'm saying? Some gunpowder, something. Gunpowder? What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> you trying to catch a STD, ain't you? you? You like your girl panties dirty? Is it a big thing that you think, you know... It, Not it, super it, dirty, just a little dirty. Look, let me ask you, is it a big thing that women underwear should match? 
Match who, what? Who cares? Like the bra and the in the panties. I don't give For a shit. years, I've been wearing holy underwear, and I I will wear my bra to the fucking streams pop out of it. I'm not a fan of. Excuse me. I'm not a fan of Victoria's Secret. Oh, I can't a, fucking fit Victoria's Secret. I don't fan, know about your I'm wife. A, I'm a fan of a oh, fuck that shit. I'm a fan of a woman who just makes a pair of underwear look good. You understand me? So how do you make a pair of underwear look? Well, see, I don't Sometimes, have a flat stomach, so it got to come over my stomach. It don't matter. It don't matter. You know, okay. You know what I like almost because better than you, thongs you, is boy shorts. Like, because we, I can't fucking do the boy no, shorts. They no, go in no, my no. asshole. No, 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 no. And I'll tell you what. In some instances, and I believe in God, in some instances, in some instances mm-hmm. I believe in the thong. But I also believe there's some motherfuckers that should not wear a thong. I, I totally agree. Okay. If you, I can't wear them. I, I want a woman to walk in my room with a pair of panties on that I don't give a fuck if they got a hole in them. She makes those things look banging. If the bra is different, that's good because now you can rip it and I got an excuse. They didn't match anyway. You follow <laughs> me? Even if it's a $40 bra, you can rip the bra. You know what I'm saying? I wish my bra was cost $40. Now when, you take, now, when you take those underwear off, let's pretend, you, what do you see? Like if now I don't look in, in the old days, in the, <laughs> in the cocaine days, I wouldn't look till later. What do you mean you don't I, look? I wanted to play fucking. Let me sniff the monkey, and guess the odor. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! Oh, I would. Oh, that's oh, how I throw them off. Oh, wait a minute. That's, uh, that's uh, sniff how I the th- monkey and guess the odor. I'm like like. So let's what pretend. was? Give me an odor that you smell. <laughs> Piss. <laughs> I was a freak. Listen to me. I'd be a freak, Jack. Listen to me. <laughs> So let's pretend I met you. Let's pretend. So I, did you stop? Did you does stop? that mean that this favorite no, 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 one? No, no, no. Is that your favorite one? Let me tell you what a nasty Cuban freak I was. Oh. So let's pretend we hooked up at ten, had a couple cocktails <laughs> at eleven thirty, twelve. You said to me, Joe, you want to come back to my place? We're all fucked up. We know what time it is. We go back to your place. We put on the Isley Brothers. We dance a little bit. We make believe. <laughs> he picked black like music, Isley Brothers. And, 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 and you're like, you're thinking. I'm going to let this brother out here chill for a little while. I'm going to go inside and freshen up a little bit, take a shower. I mean, I don't know what time it is. I'm going to wash it good. But a freak like me, I don't want to. I'll never give you that opportunity. <laughs> as soon as you start telling me, baby, I got to go. I want that monkey fucking real. You know what I'm saying? I want it to be real. What's that song? To be real. Got to be real. Got to be real. To be real. You going to fuck around and get the wrong monkey. No, I don't give a fuck. I want that muffler. I want it all. Then after, whatever. Then, oh, then we throw it. That's it's, nasty, Joy. No, you got to take a chance. That's part of love. So you ever had something that you had to get off of? <laughs> Why you think so One long? time. One time. One time. Two weeks after my mother died, a girl that I was kind of in love with, kind of had a crush on. She was a year younger than me. Very, very cute. Very blue eyes. You know, we were young sucking Teddy finger and I kind of ate her but this all shit happened on the street so my mother dies and she calls me one night and she just puts it out there listen I know you're probably feeling bad what if I came over and threw you a little something so, <laughs> like this is 1979 and the thing was on that night the one with Steve McQueen the, the blob, the blob, the blob I know the blob, how I do remember that Doug, I walked all the way over to a house got her Walked all the way back to my house. It was fucking freezing. We go upstairs. We swap spit. The lady who took care of me after my mother died, she was sleeping in my mother's room. I took her into my bedroom. We swapped some spit. I take her shirt off. She had great breast. I took her pants off. I take her panties off. It was 1979, so Kotex <laughs> were like this fucking thick. And that motherfucker it opened up. It was like Miss, Miss Patty just opened up. And I almost had a heart attack. You know what I mean? <laughs> she put that thing back on. I made her walk home by herself. I ain't got time for that shit. She come over here, offer me a piece of ass, and all of a sudden that shit's bloody and shit. My mother just died. I just found my mother on the floor. And you're going to show up over here with a bloody snatch. What the fuck is wrong with Americans? You know what I'm saying? Miss <laughs> Pat. Oh, that is one that you had to get off of. Thank God for that one. Can you believe? That's the only time. Every chance I've taken, mm-hmm. it's the order I expected and the order <laughs> I wanted. Because that's what turns them on. When they say to you, you know, baby, I want to freshen up a little bit. I ran like three miles. 
That's when I look you in the eye and I go, listen, that's how I want to eat it. Oh, God, I, Joey, I wanna, yeah. I want to eat that motherfucker. You don't want to eat no track, pussy. <laughs> yes, I do. That's what I want. That's, she was so shocked they made her pronounce your name like, oh, yes. Let me tell you something. Oh, Especially my God. Especially if it's got hair. That's crazy. Hair? It's, oh, my God, if it's got a little hair on it. And you go to yoga and come Oh, home, Joey, And I yes. catch you right before you go in that shower. Oh, my God. And I spread it out. Oh, Joey. You fucking take that little garlic smell out of that motherfucker. Garlic? What? What is it doing with a garlic smell? That, and it smells like garlic, but once you get deep, oh. it smells like ammunition. It, smell <laughs> <laughs> it probably is ammunition. The fuck is you talking about? Oh. <coughs> That's like, why you coughing like that. That's that 79 vagina in your throat. It smells like, gun, it smells like gunpowder like that. It gets in deep, deep in there. And then you, you uh, are you sure you wouldn't eat no robot? No, that's how I like. It. I like yoga pussy. Uh, wait, because I, you I'm sniff it. Gunpowder. And while you're licking the clit, you're sniffing the hair patch, and it, it's like, like it just smells fucking tremendous. Right above that little monkey. Like, oh, right Joey, little, no. Right above that clit, about an inch and a half, with that little sweat. I hope your wife don't listen to this. No, my wife don't do. I don't do this to my wife. This is when I was. A I'm kid. just saying, I don't want her to know what you did in '79. I don't give a fuck. She knows. <laughs> she got me tested twice. And shit. <laughs> I don't blame her. <laughs> you eating gym pussy? You should be tested twice. Oh my god. <laughs> I got tested twice, and then one time. Before we got married, it came up, I had syphilis. And my wife was like, what the fuck? My wife was pregnant. And it came up that she didn't have syphilis. So we're like, what you the fuck? You got the usher dick. And then we went back and they retested me. And it was something that I was eating. A pill gave me a reaction. There was no fucking syphilis. Let me ask you something. Oof. I never, ever, ever, when I heard this the first time, I was working at Fox Sports. I had just moved here. It was 1997. And at Fox Sports, there were three sisters like yourself from Atlanta, the South, and they all worked in different divisions of Fox. But when they got together, the black came out and they would talk <sighs> the black gossip of the community. And you mm -hmm. know, they started talking about Eddie Murphy <laughs> being gay, you know, Will Smith is gay, and, you know, like I don't was, believe any of that. He was but anyway. freaking. Although, but bro, these people had paperwork. You know those type of sisters. They were in the business. They were going to these parties. They were in the know. When they first, when they first told me about Eddie Murphy, they, and there was somebody else they told me about that I almost shit my fucking oh, pants. God. And then one night I was at the store, and Eddie Murphy was there with Paul Mooney, Arsenio Hall, and. The singer, the black singer from the Whitney Houston's husband's band. Bobby Brown. What's the other singer in that New band? New Edition, Bill, 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 oh, Johnny Gill. He was a Johnny Gill. And uh, and Richard Pryor's manager was up there drinking with a fucking, he used to get fucked up up there. I forget what his name is. And he, he, we, I was standing there with a couple other comics, and he looked at me and goes, Cuba, you want to see me rattle these motherfuckers? Watch this. He walked up to him, and he goes, hey, so when are you motherfuckers going to do the Queens of Comedy Tour? And they just fucking split, dog. At this time, when I had heard all this shit, it was, it was mind-boggling. And then I asked Eddie Griffin, and Eddie Griffin would tell me different stories and shit I didn't know about, but... What the fuck is going on with us? I don't want the white version. Oh my I want God. the black. Let's hold on. Let's first talk we, about we, we the guy Kelly. that pees about that yeah, guy. That's R. Kelly. Break down the black side of this oh my report. I don't. I mean, all I know is R. Kelly's supposed to be keeping some girls in his house and he's supposed to have a coat, but you know, he's supposed to not let them go. I don't know. They all went on YouTube and say they was fine. Yeah, but that's the first thing they have you do in a coat. Uh, you have to admit that well, there's no wrong. Let's hold on. Let's trace it all the way back. I thought he had like a permit. This permanent. motherfucker married Aaliyah and then At he got 14, a At 14, yes. Okay. Yes. Then tapes resurfaced. Of him I've never him. seen the tape. Have you seen the tape? I don't even want to see it. Me neither. Of him marrying on. Aaliyah or him pissing on somebody? <laughs> him, pissing on, him pissing on the girl, the underage girl. So he's been in trouble. Several and, times. And he's bought himself out. 
Yeah, he he's bought got tons of out. money. He just bought rents. I do. I mean, I kind of think something is wrong with R. Kelly. You know, it's like, and nobody's going to keep crying, crying the same thing about a particular person. You know, it's like, it's almost like when Bill Cosby got in trouble with all those women. You know, at first as a comic, and you know, Bill Cosby is a legend. And, you know, five, two, three women, you know, oh, go fuck yourself from the 70s. Kill why him. would he yeah. cheat on his wife? Yeah, why is she, yeah then it's yeah, 50. Yeah. You're like, wait a minute. Well, not even at 50, at 10, you was like, come on, y'all. It's just too many people with the same story. I think I lost it at five, and I was like, it's just too many people saying the same shit. About this person, so you know they're gonna retrial him. Are they? I mean, you, I want to believe. I want to believe it's not true. But I mean, when so many people come out and say the same thing, same thing with R. Kelly. Everybody's saying the same thing. You know, you for some reason he like his monkey young. And what about Usher? Usher just supposed to be going around giving bitches hot dicks. <laughs> He's supposed to have a uh, syphilis. Herp. Uh, herpes, 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 herpes. Oh yeah. God, he's, spo- he's supposed to go, you know, I guess that's why he made that song, Let It Burn. And the new girl today came out, she was a plus size girl, and the internet did her no justice. No justice. Somebody, I heard somebody say, she sure she slept with the right usher, the usher, the usher, the singer, or the usher from the concert? I don't understand that. What did she think was going to happen when she went, like... Why didn't you just have, sue Usher? Why do you put on a cut? Co- well, the first girl got a million dollars, so now everybody wants a million dollars. Yeah, but you don't need for, to do a press but, conference. But my thing is, is de- evidently he was flared up when he fucked that girl. You can't say Usher gay. You you don't even have a herpes, so you wasn't in danger if you wasn't flared up. And you know I said it earlier. You want you know it's like when you lay down with somebody, you you um, you don't protect yourself. Then you said, well, this person didn't tell me they had it. Well, you didn't tell him what the fuck you had. I mean, if you're going to do one night stands, I, I truly believe both sides should say what you got. Yeah, it's a- I mean, you got to ask the question, hey, is your dick on regular or is it irregular? Look at me. I'm not a good looking guy. When I saw a piece of pussy, it came as it came. If it had fucking some type of... Well, event, you eating gym pussy. That's different. No gym pussy. I would meet girls in bar. You know, you do comedy. You're in Indianapolis. You're in Indianapolis. I'm in uh, Bozeman, Montana. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I got the weekend there, Friday and Saturday. It's part of a one night a week. You start on Tuesday and end up in Bozeman. The first show, the door girl's cute. We talk a little bit. The second show, we talk a little more. Uh, she sees me. I go outside and smoke pot. When I come back, she goes, you should have asked. You know, now you have an idea what's going on. You didn't protect yourself? No, Saturday night, you don't fucking know. Saturday night, you come back, and now she's talking to you about weed, and she says to you, she loves doing blow, and you go, so do I, can you get some? And she goes, yeah, I have a friend that can get you an eight ball for 200 bucks. You tell him, be here at 12 after the second show. Boom, you get it. You give her two bumps, she comes out. She tells you about her boyfriend who's in the Navy. <laughs> And she misses him, and she loves him so much. And when he comes back, he's going to propose to her and shit. And you start talking to her a little more. And next thing you know, she asks you for two more bumps. And you talk to her about fucking uh, this or that. And she just told you that she had a boyfriend and shit. So in the back of your mind, you're doing coke, but hopefully another... She's good looking, so maybe another freak will come over and start talking to me. But this one here wants to talk to me. So eventually it's quarter to two. <laughs> and now this this girl's like, what are you going to do? Are you going to go home and finish that package? And I'm like, no, I'm going to go home and fucking, yeah, I'm going to go home and finish that package. And they'll ask you, do you want company? Yeah, I want company. Next thing you know, you stop at a liquor store and get a fucking case of beer, a carton of cigarettes, and you go to the hotel room. You start snorting at two. By seven o'clock, somebody's going to be naked. Mm-hmm. You eat each other out. You're 69. Why do you eat everybody out? Oh, God because damn you gotta lick that monkey. I'm a savage. You're 69. You suck that dick. Ain't nobody 69 in that dick. You got a mighty dick. This when I was. This when I was young. This when I was young. I was. I was virile. I've heard this. I heard could pick 60. women up and shit. <laughs> hey, you, you gotta stop eating everybody you meet, Joey. That, that's, that's dangerous. Listen, I come in a minute. 
So I got to make a good impression. You still coming to me. At that time, I was coming real quick, especially if I just met you. I was excited just to take my dick out in those days. <laughs> I'd blow up as soon as my dick touched your clit. I'd be, <laughs> oh, sh- oh Joey, was, you so nasty. It was terrible when I was a kid. So I didn't, I, my plan was. I'm surprised be, you don't have a lot of kids. So this was my plan was when I was, once I got divorced, was when I realized I had a problem with ejaculation problems. <laughs> right? Right? Like something was fucking with my head. Wait a minute, was you? Was you? When okay, I first, go, go, when go, I go. first moved out from Colorado, I could put some dick out to you. In '85, I met a store this one night, and I laid some dick t-shirt. on her. And I then, put some dick on and then I met a man, a neighbor, and all she wanted, she was 22 in college, and I don't want to have sex, but I'll give you blowjobs. What the fuck is that? So I would go to her house at night, and after like an hour of bad TV. She'd suck my pipe. That was it. <laughs> <coughs> then I met my future wife, and we were both into coke. And once we moved to Aspen, those were fucking six-hour sessions. And, you know, once I come, you got to start sucking again. Oh, God, Joey. And then I would start eating your ass until my, you know. So in those days, I knew I would come quick. So my plan would be to seduce you, mm-hmm. lay you down, eat your monkey, while I was eating your monkey, the excitement would make me dizzy and shit. And I would what? Bang. Yeah, because I got anxiety attacks. So why I'm not a handsome dude. So I know if I got a chick laid down looking up and her legs are up. And she's not screaming. And she's not screaming and there's no mace in her hand. <laughs> I'm excited. You know what I'm saying? So I'm eating her little monkey. Next thing you know, Miss Pat, I wag myself out. Oh, God, I come real Joey. quick. And then... I get it like semi hard. She's hot as fuck. I switch over. I put my stominky in her mouth, and I just finger bang her. She blows her little monkey. She brings my dick back to life. Now I go back in there like a superhero because I'm refueled. I crack the nut. The anxiety's gone. And then you King Kong. And then I'm King Kong, and it's all over. But the shout, they're just tapping out. Stop, stop, Jesus Christ. Let's do some more coke. Fuck it. Put a coke rock in your pussy. Let me lick that motherfucker. Oh, I want, Joey. I'm like, oh, yeah, Miss Pat, <laughs> come on, dog. We were the real deal in the fucking 80s, uh, dog. I wasn't doing all that bullshit, Joey. Yeah, yeah. Goddamn, I was with one guy. He was married, but damn. <laughs> you make my story sound okay. And then I was married. I was oh, very I good. I went to prison. I was very good. I got married. And then once I started comedy... I always had a certain respect for women. <laughs> Thank you for that. Until I started comedy. I saw the other side of women. <laughs> Damn. I saw what women are capable of doing and how quick they could do it. It's, it's just, we're, we're, women are just as vulnerable as men are, and men are just as vulnerable as women are. You know, when you go on those triple runs, have you ever heard of triple runs? Mm-mm. Triple runs are when you first start in comedy. And let's say you live in Denver. After about six months, you kind of got 10 minutes. You do a little improv. What's that called? Improvise. Where are you from? Crowd work. Yeah, you crowd call work. Triple one, you send them a triple one. You send them a check. You send them a, a tape. And uh, he puts you with a headline. And he takes you to Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. Washington State, Oregon, and you would go for six or seven weeks and you would learn how to become a comedian, Miss Pat, you know? Some places you get there and they give you a note, don't curse, they're Mormons. You gotta clean up your act, or if not they throw rocks at you or some shit. Oh my God. What do you think happens when you go from these town to towns? You know, triple runs are not in Portland, Oregon. They're 180 miles up in the mountains that people come down into the city once a month to get groceries. So let's pretend you were an extra on Friends. That night on the radio, they said this guy was seen on Friends. Every woman and husband go down to these towns. Those trouble runs were a tremendous scam. Would it be like going to like Big Bear or something like that? Yes, it's going to places where there's no entertainment at night. So Hell he yeah. would pick five of those in a row. Monday, he would do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then either Saturday or Sunday were at a hotel, and it would sell out. They didn't care who you were. Yeah, I've been in places like they that. They don't care who you are. They just go down there to laugh. At those places, I learned more about women 
That's when I learned the dark side of women. That they, they, <laughs> they, they get you animal. to the hotel and, and, the, and what hotel? And, what, 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 what get you to the car? What, what, wait till you fall what, asleep. <laughs> what hotel are money. you talking about? <laughs> what hotel are you talking about? Well, wherever I, holes robbed. The MC at. goes up. The MC goes up. Uh-huh. He does fifteen minutes. I go up there. I do thirty-five minutes and twenty-two. I look like Johnny Hero. I get off the stage. Where's the first place I go? I go to the bar, I get a drink, I pick up my fucking eight ball, and I lurk by the bathroom. <laughs> How's, how do you manage to find drugs in every place you go? <laughs> because you talk about it on stage. Oh, wow. So you'll go, yeah, Jesus Christ, one night I was doing an eight ball with these people, people will clap. Those people that clap afterward, they'll come up to you and go, dog, you want to do a blast? Yeah, let me do it. Can you get more? Yeah, my buddy's got some selling a gram of coke. It's that fast. Oh, wow. Hold on, wait. Fucking uh, Wesley Snipes is flying over. <laughs> He's saving a plane and shit like that. So August 22nd, what happens, my love? August 22nd, my book drop. Um, Carl Rabbit, it's a memoir. It's, on, it's online, my website, misspatcomedy.com. August 25th through the 26th, I'm doing a book signing in Indianapolis at Morty's Comedy Joint. So we're going to do four shows and four book signings. So uh, people can come out and do a meet and greet and get their book signed and watch the show. So How long was the process of the book? Two years. The it book take was two long years. Fucking time. Yes, it did. A lot of thought. And like you said, you, get, was, the, you get the certain chapters that... You write it out, and then you read it, and you go, you know what, I, I got to do something else. And you you have to go for a ride. Yeah, I mean, the, the lady who wrote it with me, which is, her name is Janine Amber, uh, oh, it was so much back and forth. It was so many tears. It was just, it was, we just, you know, like she would write something, and I was like, that's not my voice. Then she would go fix it. So it was, it was interviewing a lot of people. You know, like from my past, and she's from she's a she's black, but she's from Canada, and she was scared to. Uh, some people were scared to talk to her because she spoke correct correct English. They like, uh, who is this white bitch? And I'm like, she's not white, she's black. So <laughs> it was just you know digging up old stuff. It was it was a lot. It was a lot of work. It's a lot of work to write in a book. Well, you know, being a being on being an author. And, you know, honestly, she sat there and she put this story together, which I thought she did a wonderful job. And, you know, it's getting good reviews. It made memoir of the month for Amazon. But it, it was some hard fucking work. It was, let me tell you, I've done, I thought I've done hard shit in my life. But this book, this book is a, it put me to it. Miss Pat, I'm working on four years on this fucking book. Because the, the chapters I got to write, I got to go to such a fucking dark place. Yes. That I thought, like, because there's times I find myself there. I'll eat a couple of these fucking stars, and I'm <laughs> driving home, and that song will come on. Call me when you, and I think of summer 82. When I was 18 years old, no parents, lived in my friend's basement, no car, no bank account. I lived hand to mouth. His mother charged me $50 a week to live there. All my responsibilities, I took out garbage. And I fucking did laundry. I had to do my own laundry and fold it. That was it, man. Everything else that came into my pocket, Miss Pat, I had to do whatever I fucking had to do. And you know what? You try to work. You try yeah. to work for a while. And you go, what the fuck is this? I could sell an eight ball and make this in fucking ten minutes. I got to be here mopping the floor for eight hours and shit. Yeah, I mean, that, like I said right earlier, yeah. with me it was just that I was so young. So it was so hard to get a job. Cause I was so fucking young, but you know, I overcame a lot of shit. And you know, writing this book, writing this book tells stories that I never really told. Like it, it tells stories about situation. Like when I got, when I read the book, I literally cried. Some like chapter five, I, I never told anybody about chapter five. When my husband read it, he was fucking shocked. So it's you know, it's just me telling stories that I, I was never able to tell openly. So I just I just opened up and said, I'm gonna tell you as much as I can remember. 
How do you feel about it now? Are you I good? like it. I really do. I I do. It's you know when when we first finished it last year, and, and the editor was like, "No, you got to start over." I was a little upset, but I tell you, it was the right decision, and it made the book a better book. So it, it actually reads like a movie. It's it's a really good book. It's amazing what you th- like. I want to be a part of the writing. In my world, I want to write it. I want to write it, send it to the editor, let him fix it, put it together, my agent Gordon, and then we'll put the presentation packet together, let him put all the P's and Q's. I'm just trying the best I can, but it's taken me. I started writing a blog on MySpace every Monday. That's how I got myself back into writing, a blog about my life in order every Monday about something that happened. In high school, I went to a party and a fight broke out and I stepped on a piece of fucking glass. Something's going on. Something's on fucking fire, dog. Yeah. So, you know, I'm I'm just glad it's finished. That's the big... Finally, I feel like I accomplished something. You know, because you have so many uh, fires going at one time, but nothing really cooking. So, one thing I can say about the book is finally done. That's what I'm happy about. You know, we I sold a I sold a, a pilot to Fox last year along with Lee Daniel and um, Ron Howard Company Imagine, and you know that's just kind of up in the air. We're still working on it, and and it's t- finishing this book just puts I was able to complete something, so I'm just glad it's completed. It's crazy how how many people, and I'm not uh, I don't even know the word while I lived here. People moved to this town, got hooked up with Conan O'Brien. Yeah. You know, and they got a great director, and they got somebody great to write the pilot. And take the pilot, you know, it's such a hard collaboration. You went into it going, I'm going into this motherfucker with Lee Daniels, the motherfucking black dude of the month. (laughs) <laughs> All right, motherfucker got Empire. I watched yeah. Empire for three seasons, then it went somewhere else. Nah, I was done. They tried <laughs> to good. go to Dynasty. It's the first good. two seasons, I love everybody. I love the gay son. I love you know you know. Let me tell you why I found love. I watched the pilot of that motherfucker, and there was a dude who used to write on that staff, Eddie Velez, and he goes, "Make sure you watch the pilot. The pilot fucked my shit." Up, Jack. That's a good fucking show. You know when? When he rules Wednesday night. When he put the little gay kid was about five at home. He was in the living room with a gangster capella, and the two other kids were babies. And that little kid came in, the gay one. Mm-hmm. He walked in the room with a dress on and women's heels, like uh, his sister's shoes. And what's his name? Howard. What's it? What's uh, Terrence Howard. Terrence Howard was reading like a paper with gold teeth and shit. And he looked up and he saw this kid. And he fucking slammed down the paper. He picked this fucking kid up. Took him down the stairs. Opened up a metal garbage can. <laughs> and put him in the garbage can head first. And closed the lid on this I remember that scene. I was like, God damn. And right there. Because I remember when I came from Cuba, my, my, my buddy was, was black. And their family was not fucking gay friendly. Well, like, black, the black community is just uh, the black community has came around in the last five to ten years. With I think they, you know, well, I think the world is beginning to say, you know, do what makes you happy. Absolutely. And that's what it's all about. You know, stop living for other people. If you, you know, do what makes you fucking happy. That's what I had to learn. I mean, for years I've tried to make other people love me, and other people, you know. Be put other people before me and I learned in the end I gotta fucking love myself when I love myself and respect myself everybody else will begin to care and respect me <clears throat> you know what I'm an old school like the man said if you want respect you gotta give respect yeah. you treat me with the respect that you want I stay away from people who I'm, no, no, I'm the same way I'm old man Yeah, I'm getting old Miss Pat that little four and a half year old wears me out I feel you. I got four of them at the house, and you know, that's this was. I just, I just hope people realize, you know, after reading the book, you know, be you, do what makes you happy, because that's what I ended up doing. 
Now, Miss Pat, what years does this book cover? Uh, it just from childhood, from growing up in the bootleg house, to prop to my marriage. It doesn't talk about uh, the comedian much, Miss Pat. You know, it tells you how I kind of got started, but to 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 ninety three. Well, when yeah. Did, when did you start comedy, Miss Pat? I started comedy. I'm fifteen years in. So by night two thousand. Were you a storyteller from the beginning? No, Mm-mm. I did not. I didn't you know were I, slipping for a long time, like I did. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know I told stories. Like I, I really didn't think my past was that funny until you know I would constantly tell people, and people would say you got unique stories. Won't you put them on stage? And then you know it's it's, it's all about then you got to figure out how to put them on stage. So, you know, when when I moved to Indianapolis in 2006 is when I really realized I was a storyteller. It took me eight years to tell a story on stage. And once the first time you do it, it blows yeah. your fucking mind. And it means that, like, I was in the belly room. At that time, the belly room meant shit to me. Do you understand me, Miss Pat? I didn't move to Atlanta to do spots in the belly room, Lee. I was getting room sets in the original room. And one night I went into the belly room. Somebody goes, bro, you got to do the show. It's sold out. Please go upstairs. Just We have nobody else. And I kind of went up there with attitude and shit. Miss Pat, I ate a bag of dicks. <laughs> the first joke died. Second joke died. Third joke died. And I said, fuck you motherfuckers. Until this day, I can't remember what story I told. It does. I mean, you you pro, you've been doing comedy so long now. Does it bother you when a joke don't hit? No. Me neither. I don't give a fuck because no. I tell young comics. I said, you know, when you're working, I mean, it's like baking a cake. It's like baking a cake and that bitch fall in the middle. Okay, you didn't you didn't add the right ingredients. Go back and try again. And people ask me all the time, like, does it bother you? I hear come and say, well, oh, when I have a good set, I have a good week. When I have a bad set, I have a bad week. I don't give a fuck. It's, me, it, me. When I'm not, when you didn't pay to see me and I'm literally up there at an open mic, I am creating, I'm working. So I don't give a fuck about how you feel <coughs> about a joke. Okay, it didn't work. Then I go home and I tweak it and rework it and come back. But I see a lot of comics, they get really depressed at open mic. And I'm like, bitch, you at open mic. What you going to do when you fucking in front of a thousand people one day and you bomb? When I was on the road, Mr. Joe Rogan, Mr. Joe Rogan used to pay me good money. The show Joe started, looked like he paid good money. Okay. <laughs> Joe paid me great money, and he knew my money was going, half of it was going to drugs. He still loved me. He still knew I was funny, but he also knew I was a ham and egg. I was a 50% comic. I would go up there, throw out a thought, if it ran, Miss Pat, you got problems, bitch. <laughs> if you got to follow Joey after that set, that's one of those cocaine from the night before fuel mm-hmm. set, and he knows he's picking up another rock in an hour type set. <laughs> he just wants to get this set over with. So he's trying. I would fucking kill rooms, and Joe would love it. But there were also sets, guys, that I would go up there and eat a bag of dicks. Why? Did I, did I get a notebook? No. I, I went to dinner with Miss Pat. And I got high with Miss Pat's husband. And then I went to Indianapolis and did two, for, not drugs, but smoke pot. You know what I'm saying? Uh huh. Now people pay to come see us, Miss Pat. Yes. So now, guess what I do on Friday before the show? What? Nothing. I don't want to see nobody. I don't want to talk to you. I don't, uh, what, what do you want to talk about? I got two Sweet. shows. They're paying $25 to come to see me. Yeah. Okay? I don't want you in your room going, me, 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 me. That's bullshit. I want you in your room with your feet up. At about 5 o'clock, you go down to the gym, you get on the bicycle, you do 20 minutes, you do a couple jumping jacks, you get everything nice and sweaty, you go upstairs, you order a little room service, because if you go to the bar, you got to sit there for an hour. You ain't got an hour. Before the room service comes up, you pray, he says, 70 for 45 minutes, you're sweaty. You take your notebook out, and you go over your notes. And you and I'm not telling you to write. I didn't say nothing about write. I just yep. said to go through that notebook because going through that notebook will raise, will raise your percentages right there. Mm. You took a shower, your mind was calm, and you were set on the thing. 
I love the comic that walks in, Miss Pat, and says, man, I want Biggie as my warm-up song. That dude already lost. He's thinking about his song. Yeah. That's why I don't, I don't give bring, fuck what you play. You play what I'm saying? That's why, yeah. I don't, that's why I don't bring T-shirts on the road. I don't want to be worried about 62 T-shirts and size double X. You know what? I'm worried about my motherfucking stand-up. Yes. I want these people to come see me next time. So when you're a feature act, you act a certain way. And when you're a headliner, you got to act a certain way. And next thing you know, good things happen for you, man. And I didn't make this up. I watched Bernie Mac. I watch, you know, the great ones. I love Richard Pryor. You go out there and focus on what the fuck you're doing. Years ago, I used to go, fuck Joe Rogan and his MySpace bullshit. <laughs> Joe was on MySpace. I'm snorting blow going, do you think Richard Pryor would go home and get on MySpace? Do you? <laughs> do you think Richard Pryor would go home in his prime and get on MySpace? Fuck you, MySpace one of motherfuckers. One day, we did Irvine. And that motherfucking room was sold out on 4th of July weekend with no radio. And I said, this motherfucker's on to something. This was 10 years before the podcast. Oh, wow. He was already on to that shit. He was already getting the people to the internet. Yeah. So it's been an education. We're, listen, you and I are both uh, prime examples that if you open your heart on these podcasts, yeah. Great things could happen. This all started with us telling people about our lives. How great is this? It sure was. I mean, I, I can't thank the podcast family enough. Every one of y'all. You, Joey, Mark, Ari, Bert, Tom, Segura, and his wife, and so many more. I can't fucking name. Look, the first time you came in here, you had a fucked up eyebrows. Your shirt had a hole in it and shit. <laughs> your nails weren't done and shit. You had a fucking... You had a Fugazi <laughs> diamond on this shit. You had one of those Cuban zirconians on. <laughs> so what Look the fuck am I now? You went to a steam room. They rubbed you down. <laughs> they plucked your eyebrows. They gave you a little shampoo and shit. They gave you that Korean well, rub. Damn, I look well, like that. That's how good you look. They took that old What fucking off. shirt with the hole in it, Joel? I don't know. You threw it away. It's over. I'm not going to bring it up and shit. You brought it up from North Carolina in 1982. <laughs> God, he said, no. that's what he's always said, bitch, you was ugly. But no, you, I you did know. not. I did not say about ugly. I just said that, you know, no, there was no away. dollars coming in. You know, now no. you're looking good. What God the, bless yeah, you. Yeah. She just has my hand, and her hands are so soft. It's oh, like, my God. No, no, no. She goes to, like, a, a like, oh, my God. She goes to, the, to like, the nail I'm salon every day. What the fuck do you shea butter like other black people do? Shit. I don't know what the fuck you talking about. <laughs> That's good shea butter. See, you used to get but <laughs> you used to get shea butter two for one <laughs> with Afro Sheen. That's premium now, shea butter. Now you get the real shea butter That's by whole food shea butter. The shit you rub on your feet, and your feet don't crack. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I have been blessed. I, I can't lie about that. I. I I gotta be honest. I've been blessed. I mean, some good things have really came my way. You know, the book, the uh, whole Lee Daniel thing with uh, Imagine. I mean, sometimes I wake up and I was like, "What the fuck did I do to deserve this?" You know, I, I get to talk to a powerhouse. You know, almost any time I want, like Lee Daniel, and always giving me advice. Great, great dude. Great dude to know. I mean, been nothing but nice. You know, and it, it, how did you get in contact with him? Well, um, well, I did. I saw. Well, we. I first had a deal with New Regency, uh, and my contract ended, so we we left. And literally, uh, Imagine called a couple of days later and wanted me to meet Lee. So I went out to Chicago, and I was like, oh, they shoot, they shoot Empire in Chicago. So I was like, I don't really know about Lee Daniel. You know, I'm scared. He's gonna be really famous acting and you know i'm saying well what do i say to this big time guy you don't want an oscar and the monster ball precious you know you don't really know how people gonna act ended up being the fucking realest person i ever met in my life i mean just just like me and you i mean you know how you meet somebody who's like i want to choose my words right you know immediately made me feel like you know i was just as equal as him you know you can meet some people that make you feel like Ah, I'm up down here. To you. Yeah, yeah, talking yeah. down to you. Yeah. Not one time I ever felt like that. You know, not one time. A great dude, and, and you know, he took me in with his team to Fox, and we sold the put pilot, which was, you know, now we we got a we just we had to switch writers, uh, so we got a new writer, and we go on and. 
pitch it again and hopefully it'll get up and going. But I can't say anything about bad about Imagine or Lee Daniel, uh, any Look, of those guys. Number one, Brian Grazer. You have been blessed dearly because yes. Lee Daniels has a successful fucking tremendous numbers show on two, Fox. two star two, two shows. So that means he's got three more, four more shows left on him. Yes. Okay, and yours is one on that list. And I that, pray. And the stars <laughs> may not fall now. But he regroups and take that motherfucker to Netflix or CBS. You know, everybody's buying shows right now. Yes. So, you know, you're in good fucking hands. So you really got to get up in the morning and say, Jesus, fuck. I do. I thank God every day. You know, I, I just, everything. I mean, then not only that, what people don't know is the behind the scenes stuff that he studied do to help my career. You know, he read my book. He gave me a blurb. He, you know. He didn't have to do that. I got an article coming out in the Washington Post, and the twentieth on the twentieth, you know, he just he he does so much other stuff. Like if I ask, you know, and it's just for my career. Is Lee? Can you do this for me? Sure. What, what, what do I need to do? You know, that's a scary thing. The biggest thing is I'm scared to ask, but whenever I do ask, you know, it's always yes. And I mean, I'm a person where. You know, I've been through so much in my life. I like to earn what I get in this world. I don't want to be handed any fucking thing. And, you know, I, I don't, I, I haven't get, we haven't produced a show where everybody's getting paid yet. So I really don't like asking. I feel like I don't want nobody to ever think I'm just there for them to give me anything. I want to work for whatever I get. So that's the scary part about this business too. You know, they'll they'll fly you out, they'll put you up and invest in you and then the shit don't work out. I feel like I've taken advantage of somebody. So my whole thing is I just I want I always I just like to work for what I get. And that's what I constantly tell all of them. I just I, I want this show to be successful so you know we all can make some money from it. So it don't feel like I'm some fucking freeloader. The first two, three, four, five, six months in the business. Did you ever think you'd be in this position? Fuck no. No, no, I tell Lee all the time. I had no. five years of doing comedy. Did you think you'd be in this position? No. With the hottest three <laughs> producers in Hollywood and fucking Opie. You're in business with fucking Imagine. Can you fucking imagine? Like, it, it, when you're at doing that one night and people are talking about going to Montreal and, and you're sitting there like an animal, you don't even have a manager. And this all changed because you went on a few podcasts and opened your heart and fucking people were blown the fuck away. Yeah. They had never heard. And then the same thing happened with me. I told shit that I would never tell anybody. I, I, I thought this happened in everybody's life. Yes, yes, most definitely. I mean, I mean again, no, I, I didn't think. I, ten, years, ten years ago, I mean, in 2006 when I moved from Atlanta to Indianapolis, no, I did not think that this is where I would be at. In 2017, no. I mean, my whole thing is I always just say, I just want to get in the clubs. I just want to be a feature act. Then you get the feature act one. Now I say, if I could just make a thousand dollars a week, that's five thousand dollars a month. I can help my husband pay the bill, or I have enough money to get my layaways out on time. You know, it's always been my biggest focus. Don't fucking let your layaway go back. So, uh, I just wanted to make up enough money so I can be independent. You know, all of this other stuff with a book and. You know, a book shocked the shit out of me because I was like, you bullshit, right? Y'all gonna buy this shit? <laughs> it was shocking, you know, because I always wanted to tell my story, but I can't write a fucking book. I knew I couldn't write it. So when it came along, I'm first of all, let me say, I'm the type of person where I grew up, don't believe the half of the shit you hear. Don't believe half of the shit you see and none of the shit you hear. So I needed to be 100% before I fucking believe in it. And when the lady came along and said she could write the book, I was like, oh, whatever, we'll see. And when it really happened, it, I was like, well, damn. Would you do it again? Would you write another book? Would I write another book? It yes. was hard. <laughs> My husband said I got another book in me. I, I don't ha know. You have two more in you. Number one, you have, uh, you have one story. Now, like... But you have to also write it and look at yourself and go, you know what? I'm going to write this about me, but I'm writing this for Vivica Fox. Mm. Because I'd rather 
sell this and it become an Academy Award winner and guess who wrote it and now guess how much they give me for my next one eight million and on that one I could write a story about my pussy uh, they already wrote the check that's what happens to people in Hollywood your second one is about your kids just flip it that's an Oprah movie that goes right to Oprah you tell Lee hold on one second we already got this thing cooking I gotta go talk to Oprah about this one <laughs> this is about a 15 year old girl that has a relationship with a married man and has two children and it's you but it really isn't you and it ends maybe with what you how, how you wanted it to end and then there's the other side of a single mom that's 17 slinging fucking on the corner you have three or four books in you that's what my you husband know. always says. he's like you got another one but who knows you yes know? you just have to get a notebook Get a book, The Art of Writing. Get all that book. Read them. But the most consistent thing is to say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to write 10 words a day. That's it. 10 fucking words a day. A fucking child can write 10 words a day. And next thing you know, you start getting into it and getting into it more and getting into it more. And then a year and a half from now, you get yourself a little book, baby girl. And now your advance is a little higher. You have a bigger following from stand-up. How many fucking go... I don't, we don't have time, but Lee, if we sit here, how many comedians have made millions from book? That first Chelsea Handler book made only $12 million, you know. And then she was taking it on the road in stadiums and banging you out for 30 to sign the motherfucker. You know, mm -hmm. you have to look. That's commerce. This is what this business is about, and this is what you're good at. You have 10 stories in your fucking soul. Well, we'll see. You know, I, I don't know right now. I just finished one. So hopefully, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's going to do well. August 22nd? August 22nd is on, is on pre-sale now. Please go out and order it. It's a, you know what's crazy, Joy? My husband read it. And I was, I, you know, my husband is a big critic. You know, a lot of time I say he's not a Miss Pat fan, but he's really an undercover Miss Pat fan. And he was like, this is a fucking movie. This is a good book. Oh, yeah, yeah. This and is he didn't say that because I was his wife. Because he read shit and be like, uh-uh, get rid of that shit. But honestly, he said, you know, and I take, I listen to my husband a lot. It's so, I, I read it too. It's a fucking good book. R. Kelly got a roll in it? No. Right before, <laughs> listen, right before he gets locked up, you give him a cameo. <laughs> like a he could be my first baby daddy, yes. that bitch. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he could be on the audio book. <laughs> yeah. I did. I got an audio book. Is out for. Is you can buy that too now. What's your your next few dates that you're doing? Um, Morty's. I'm at Morty's August 25th through the 26th. Promoting the book. And yeah, doing signs and taking uh, pictures and yeah, showing how beautiful you um, look. Sep in September, I'm at, I'm in Boston at the Boston Comedy Festival. Okay. Uh, I know I'm coming to Cincinnati in November. I'm trying to pull it up. Lee, you can pull it up faster. Okay. It's patcomedy dot com. Um, if you're in the Indianapolis area, please come out. I would love to meet you. If you never heard of me before, she's fucking solid. Let me do some shout outs real quick. Alan Soraka, Colin Parker Jr., Jeremy Slagoth. I'm coming to Tampa, cocksucker. G Gebned, Roberio, <laughs> Daniel, Lolo, or something, Dennis, Dumont, Tug, Dakota Gilbert, Jeff Collins, and I don't know what else it says. I was fucking stoned when I wrote this list. Don't forget, we added a second show on Thursday night in the Punchline in San Francisco. Damn. The weekend tickets are sold out, and I don't work on the Lord's Day. So it's a 10-15 show, myself and Dean Del Rizzi. Real quick. Let me talk to you people about something. I don't know what's going on with your life. You know, Miss Miss Pat comes on here. She tells me what's crack I lacking. And listen, if you hear the sirens, this is all real. We don't fuck around with three D, all right? <laughs> and all those sound effects. They've been oh, yeah, well, they've been going all fucking going night, on. Joey. <laughs> something's been going on, like uh, either ISIS attacked the airport. Don't say that shit. I gotta fly out of here Wednesday. It's a lot of shit on fire. I don't think ISIS is attacking Burbank Airport. Yeah, what the fuck do you know? What are you, Swami from Salami? You don't know what's cracking. Can I read lacking? two of these dates off real quick? Can you do what? <laughs> Can I read two of these dates off real quick? Yeah, yeah. We, read the next four. Voice. Because after that, you got to assume that they don't have a pencil and shit. Okay, go, And they're cocksuckers. Read it, Lee. The next four. Absolutely. So, it's the Boston Comedy Festival, September 21st to the 23rd. 
And then you're in Richmond, Virginia, October 5th to the 8th. Then you're at uh, the Joke Joint in Houston, October 12th to the 14th. And then you're back in your home state of... Oh, no, never mind. You're in Ble- yeah, Bloomington, Minnesota, <laughs> House of Comedy, uh, Mall of America, the 25th to the 29th. Oh, yes. shit. And there's some more dates coming back in September. They're not on yet, but just keep clicking back. MissPatComedy.com, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of that shit young people do. You know, man, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking about how, uh, how when you put your time in, for years, nothing really happens, but when you really put your soul into something, doors open up, and you're the fucking beautiful example of it. And I wish you all the luck in the world. You're beautiful. You got a great soul, and you got a great story. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, I, please. I it was my fucking it. pleasure. I, you had some fucking publicists. I thought, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I'm going to talk to Miss Pat. Mind your business, cocksucker. Schlein and Kahine. <laughs> he showed up with a picture of him with a yarmulke. Get the fuck out of my fucking. Trying to Skype a motherfucker. You know I can't have you talking bad about Jewish people, Joe. I didn't say nothing bad about him. I just said that he was trying to get to me through weird sources. <laughs> Let me wrap this up and we'll get out of here. Did you know that depending on where you get a mortgage, you can save $20,000 or more? But 80% of people only get one mortgage offer like I did when I tried to get a house. And if you just go to your bank, chances are you'll get ripped off. I mean, screw. Lending Tree doesn't want this to happen. Here's the thing. The average Lending Tree customer can save $20,000 over the life of their loan. That's the average. Half of these customers could even save more, all right? Whether you're looking for a new mortgage, or you want to refinance, or a home equity loan, Lending Tree is the only place where you get five real offers from America's top lenders, and you can compare side by side for free. And guess what? It only takes three minutes. It's like shopping for flights online, only you're shopping for the best mortgage offers for you. Rates always go up and down, but regardless of what's happening with rates, you can always get the right offer for you with LendingTree.com. Like, do me a favor. Are you sure you got the best deal? Find out how much you can save today at LendingTree.com slash church. I don't know if you're looking for a mortgage. I don't know if you're looking for a house. But if you're looking for one, do me a favor. Before you do anything, before you sign anything, do yourself a favor and go to LendingTree.com slash church, all right? That's LendingTree, LendingTree.com slash church. LendingTree, LLC, NMLS pound 1136. Terms and conditions apply. Go to LendingTree.com slash church. Number two, listen. You work hard all day. You're trying to watch your weight. You don't have time. You're trying to save money. You want to go home at night. You really want to stop at a fast food joint or some place that serves terrible food. And how long is that going to last for? How long are you going to last for? All right. This is not good. This is where Blue Apron comes in. As far as affordable, you don't even know what Blue Apron is. Let me tell you. It's the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everybody, even to momos like myself and Lee Syatt. Lee Syatt, for example, lives off Blue Apron. Me, I get it every like couple weeks <laughs> as filler when mama's not home or something like that. Blue Apron is tremendous. Tell them, Lee. Blue Apron's great. It's delicious. It taught me how to cook. I got my dad on it. My dad literally every single day of the week, every month, has Blue Apron. He loves it. It's delicious. And listen, it's $10 per person per meal. Blue Apron will deliver seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Variety? Forget about it. You choose from a variety of new recipes each week, or you let Blue Apron's culinary team just surprise you. I know you love surprises. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. Flexible? Forget about it. Customize your recipes each week based on your preferences. Blue Apron has several delivery options, so you can choose what fits your needs. And there's no weekly commitment. 
So you only get the deliveries when you want them. Each meal comes with a step-by-step. Ready for this one? Easy to follow recipe card, proportioned ingredients, and they can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. You can't lose. You're single, whatever, you're trying to lose weight, you're trying to eat healthy, this is the way to go. Plus, Blue Apron's freshness guarantee promises that every ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they'll make it right. Now, here's what I'm going to do for you. Check out this week's menu, all right? What do you like this week? What, what did you get, Lee? Oh, I got some great stuff. I got steak and potatoes, like steak and like french fried uh, potatoes. I got uh, the chicken tenders. That was really great. And I'm forgetting the third one, but it was, they, they have so many, they recently increased the options you have, you, you get to choose from. It's better than ever. All right, so check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free. <coughs> Again, you get your first three meals for free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash Joey. That's right. Three free meals with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash Joey. You'll love how it feels and tastes and to create home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Do yourself a favor. That's blueapron.com slash Joey. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Again, I want to thank Blue Apron. Again, I want to thank Lending Tree. Again, I want to thank Onnit. But most importantly, I want to thank one of my favorite guests because uh, when uh, she comes on, I get what it's like the rolling, it's like uh, sliding the family stone. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I get what the fuck I get. I don't get somebody outside and you turn into somebody else. Today. No, not with this. I'm happy about your success. God well, bless thank you. Thank you. Your daughter's beautiful. You have a beautiful family. I read your little fucking Twitters and uh, uh, good luck for you. Never mind the misspell words. Don't and, uh, be fucking nah, with me. Who gives a fuck? I'm no Phi Beta Kappa. <laughs> and I will retreat all your stuff around book time. Thank you, my baby. Word. And I make sure I'm going to try Blue Apron because I can't cook well for shit. Who gives a and fuck? And I'm going to play like I cook Listen, this shit. Listen, I'll get Blue Apron eat and just look at you. You know what I'm saying? That's how good you're looking. <laughs> God bless you. Knock them dead on this tour. Stop making me smile, Joey. Please go to Magoobies <laughs> for the book signing. Is it Magoobies? Morty's. Morty's. I'm sorry. Morty Magoobies. Go to Morty's. It's a great club. It is. In Indianapolis. She's going to do it the 25th 20... through the 26th. Bam! There you have it. I love you, cocksuckers. Have a great weekend. Love you too, cocksuckers. We'll talk to you, all right? Stay black. Lee, who loves you more than me? Nobody, cocksucker. Bam. Let's do this.